You guys hear me? Great. Yes. Okay. I see some friendly faces here. I recognize some of you from previous classes. That's great. That's a good sign. Let's check out the chat really quick. Uh, people are not seeing. Everyone passed FCM too with me. Yeah. Um, some people aren't seeing things in the chat. Let me just re-upload some of this stuff so you guys have access. The files that are on the Moodle are already dated because I already redid all of them. So we've got different stuff here. So this is the Herbs One Week One intro, which I'm about to put back up here. There you go. That's what we're going to start lecturing off of today. And I'm going to be giving you guys a file like this one, the where file, once a week. Those are going to be where you're going to be taking your notes. I've already filled in the basics for you. So if you don't have access to Bensky right now, it doesn't really matter. You have all of the mandatory information there. Um, how's everybody doing? Thumbs up, shrugs. OK, that works pretty well. Um, this is my first time attempting to teach a class out of my clinic. So we're going to see how this goes. Um, fingers crossed it goes well. I'm a second late in part because I just wrapped up with a patient a minute ago. Uh, can, uh, can people in general see those files in the chat? I'm getting a message from someone saying that they can't. Um, to the person messaging me privately, right above your message, you should see files that you can click and download. Are the, Peter, are the two uh, last files you sent the same as the ones you sent earlier? Yes, yes, I'm just repeating them. Sometimes um, when people come into Zoom later, it doesn't load the previous chat. Sometimes it oh. does. So I just put it up again in case people missed it. Okay. Oh, Nicole, a good thing I couldn't see you stay couldn't see you say that publicly at the school, right? Um, yeah, uh, you know, people have some unstable connections, another private message. Uh, I know anyone who's not on a computer. Okay, well, I don't really know how else to get those to you right now. They're up on the Slack in week one already for anyone who's joined and they're in the chat. Um, they're not really gonna be mandatory, I'm gonna be showing them to you, but they might be helpful for taking notes. Thank Peter, you. Oh, okay. Sorry, I have a question about Slack. I tried sure. to log back in just assuming that my old credentials would work, but it says that it doesn't recognize anything. It, um, do we have to, is there a new meeting or? Yeah, yeah, this is a new instance of Slack. Um, the ones from previous semesters, I, I delete them every semester. Okay. Um, so this is just for this class. So there should be a link in the chat here at the top. If you click that, you should be able to get back in. Most of the people, uh, we got or Slack. half a dozen people in. What is that should be the first thing I posted, but let me just post it again. Is, uh, where student, it's a document I have. It's a word. It's the first thing I see. There you go. New post. There. Ah, got it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, for sure. Anyone else having any technical issues with any of this stuff? Working okay? okay. Well, let me know if you do as we go along. Um, I know some people are, I've gotten some messages already in emails that some people are having some technical difficulties today. If you're in and out a little bit today, don't worry about it. You know, beginning of the semester, things get weird. Um, but hopefully just try to clear those up by next week to the best of your abilities. Um, yeah, I would appreciate it if you guys don't have conversations about sharing illegally copied books in front of me in a way that might get me in trouble later. So if you guys want to share PDFs, um, I want to not know about it. Does that make sense? To the people currently chatting about it? Yep, for sure. Um, that being said, if you own a copy of the book and you have a PDF of the same book, then that's, as far as I know, fair use. So as long as you own a copy, it's not a problem. So I'm sure both of you own copies and that's what you're talking about. Um, okay, so normally this is the part where we do a whole introduction and I talk to all you guys and, you know, do a little, hey, what's up sort of a thing. But um, 
this is we have so much material to cover this semester. Um, so we're gonna kind of dive right into this. Uh, most of you know, I, I know most of you, so no, most of you know me. Um, I've been teaching at Pacific College for about a year now. I graduated from Pacific College about six years ago. I've treated a ton of patients, lost count years ago after I cleared 10,000, worked in about four different countries, working here in Manhattan now. I've got a clinic over at Penn Station. I was gonna be a clinic supervisor, but you know, COVID. Um, I've been enjoying teaching. Uh, you can talk to some of your fellow students if you don't know me. Um, the Slack is here as a place for us to converse and share files. I don't particularly care for Moodle. It's very hard to edit it as a professor once things are already up there. So I'm often changing slides the week before, the day before, two hours before a class. And then putting that back up on Moodle can take five, 10 minutes easily. So I just use this Slack. If you have questions, you can easiest way to do this is to probably share that screen. Just quick intro to Slack here. Oh. Um, just one second, a little bit of technical difficulty on my end. This is my first time using um, trying to do some of this on this computer. Uh, okay, uh, I gotta log back on to be able to share my screen. One second, I'll see you guys in just one minute. Um, Christy, I'm making you the host for a minute. I'll be right back. Hey, Peter, I think you're uh, muted. Thank you. That was a lot of talking I just did while muted. I appreciate the heads up. <laughs> no problem. Um, so basically, you guys can use this to message me privately by finding me in the direct message area. We can have discussions about each week's material in these areas up here. Some semesters, this has been really busy. There's been a lot of activity. We've had good back and forth between me and the students and the students and each other, which is really important. Um, and some week, and some semesters, it's been relatively inactive. It's here. Use it if you would like. Um, you know, if you've got a question, like I'm still confused about why Shini, which we'll cover today, opens the sinuses, you can put that in here, and then I have the ability to come in and start a whole thread here. And uh, we can have an ongoing conversation where all of us are talking back and forth in public about this. Sometimes it works well. I encourage you to use it. Um, how did you all do, how did you all like um, intro to herbology? How was that for folks? If you, if you mind sharing your experience, I don't exactly know what that's like last semester online, the semester before. So a little bit of information would be helpful. Oh, you're taking it concurrently. 
okay, that's going to be a lot. I'm just giving you a heads up now. That, that's going to be a lot. I hope you're good at memorizing. If you are, you might be okay, but that's a lot. Okay. Um, oh, it was manageable online overall. Manageable online? Like, it's, I did get the herbs, but I didn't actually use a lot of them, you know, because since intro to herbs, like, I'd have to get, like, every binder, like, every week, and, or, you know, there's kind of too many binders to manage, but I feel like it'll be useful here for the Mayway um, herbs. Yeah. Yeah, I would definitely recommend that you guys get the Mayway Herb Kit. Um, I'm ordering it tomorrow so that I should be getting it around the same time as all of you. Um, it's a useful resource. If we were doing this in person, I would be providing herbal teas for you guys to sample in the classes so that you could get used to some of these flavors, despite some of them being a little gross. Um, but I def you know, getting to know these herbs by smell, by feel, there's some herbs that like the easiest way to tell them apart is cracking them open and smelling them. Um, and otherwise they look quite similar. So having those herb kits is helpful. Um, and I do not have an updated syllabus right now. By next week, it should all be updated on the Moodle, but we're gonna go over what that syllabus would look like in just one second. Um, yeah, there's, the Moodle's coming along. Um, Leela, yeah, there's really only one herb kit as far as I'm aware. If people have a different experience, please let me know. I could only find one. Uh, yeah, it runs, I think, about 200, 220 bucks. It's expensive, but it covers your entire herbal education. You'll be able to use it all the way through formulas. Um, so it's a, it's a high upfront cost now, but then you're just good. And it, they, they all come with these little, um, they come in and it comes in binders, which are easy to use, and it comes with cards with summaries of everything you have to know about each herb. So again, in a pinch, if you gotta, um, you know, if you want to get away for a weekend and want to take a little bit of stuff to study, you don't have to lug Bensky. You can just take a few sheets out of the binder. Oh, great. Um, yeah, Marianne's got uh, got it right there. Great. Yeah, Jared's got it too. So um, if you guys have questions, ask them what they think about it. If they think they were terrible, you know, I felt like I'm encouraging it, you to buy them, but it's not required. I got it for intro to herbs. Um, I felt like it was Christmas this summer <laughs> when I got this in. It was, it was really cool. <laughs> well, um, when I was a student in the school, uh, I I got really into herbs, and this is back when the school was over by the Flatiron Building on Broadway. And every week, I would go down to the herbal pharmacy that was in the clinic and I would make my own herb kit every week with like 15 cents of each herb and by the end of the time I was in herbs three they changed their policy to stop people from doing that because it was annoying them too much but it was it was fun at the time um I having the herbs in your hands makes such a huge difference like unless you're touching them and smelling them and seeing them all of this is abstract they might as well be powders but as soon as you're touching them and interacting with them the ideas of sour and bitter and sweet take on a little bit more life. Um, and the colors are nice and it, there's, there's life to them. It's, it's a different thing. So I definitely recommend it. Um, okay. Uh, I think we're just going to kind of dive into this here. We have, we have a lot to cover this semester. Um, we might be a little bit, so in theory, every week is very clean in terms of what we're covering. In practice, we'll see how that goes. This is my first time teaching this subject in this manner. So uh, we might get behind one week, we might get ahead one week, we might bounce around a little bit, but we should be able to get through everything just fine. Um, one second, and I'm gonna start sharing my herb slides. Um, before I get to that, ask questions as we go through this. Herbs are complicated, they're also Fascinating. Um, I'm, especially today and next week, we're gonna be spending a lot of time talking about why the herbs do what they do. Um, but if things aren't making sense, I don't want, there's rote memorizing you're gonna have to do. You're gonna have to rote memorize the names. You're gonna have to rote memorize some of the aspects of the herbs. But you should also be able to use the flavors in the channels to figure out the function. And if you look at the functions, you should be able to figure out the flavors in the channels for most herbs most of the time. And so as we're going through, if that's not making sense, please ask questions. If you run into those questions while you're studying, put them up in the Slack, we can have a conversation. If you have an issue, your other students probably do. 
if you're shy about asking questions in public, message me privately. What I'll often do is strip out anything that makes it clear that it came from you and then post the question as if I'm asking it anonymized and then answer it in public so we can have a dialogue. Um, yeah. Uh, let's go over what this semester is going to look like. And if you have questions, interrupt me and let me know. And if I suddenly become muted, please let me know. All right. There we go. So um, welcome to Herbology One. I'm just going to get these windows organized properly so I can see my screen while we're talking. OK. Um, congratulations. I think you've made a great decision to study herbs. Herbs are optional. Everyone has to do intro to herbs, but now you've all committed to at least trying to continue it. Um, a lot of people who go through the MSTOM program don't end up doing a ton of herbology in their practice. Even if that's true, you're going to be such a better acupuncturist for this. Um, it's in the herbal program that I think a lot of the acupuncture theory really gets taught at a deeper level. A lot of the Chinese medicine theory. So as you go through this, I'm going to try to incorporate some of the information that you should be learning in your points classes and in your FCM classes, mesh all that together a little bit. Um, traditionally, acupuncture and herbology were different professions. They were different fields of medicine, but the theory behind them is the same. So when we talk about, for example, using herbs to vent heat out of the skin, when it comes to acupuncture, we're also going to be thinking about venting heat out of the skin. The mechanism by which we do that might be a little bit different. We might be using different points, but the thought process behind it is going to be similar. We're going to spend a, quite a bit of time this semester talking about how to deal with infectious disease and how to deal with heat pathogens. Both of those things are things that, tra that um, translate directly over to um, acupuncture quite nicely. So we'll, we'll try to pepper that in, but we'll see how we're doing on time for that. Uh, hi, Nelsie. Everything seems to be working right now. Uh, if anyone has a problem, we've got one of the, I guess, IT staff here, part of the host team. So feel free to ask her if you, I, I think Nelsie's a woman's name. Um, I'm not sure. Ask Nelsie if you have any questions or problems. Thanks, Nelsie. Okay. So how is Herbs One going to be different from Introduction to Herbs? Uh, we're, in just a second, we're going to go over what the semester is going to look like. But we also need to, I'm going to spend some time today reviewing how flavors, temperatures, and channels work with herbs, a little bit of an introduction to how I recommend you go about studying some of this, and what sort of things I'm going to expect from you to know about each herb. I'm basing my expectations of what I want from you on what's going to be on your board and comprehensive exam. And then we're going to be going a step past that. And I'm going to be asking, often as extra credit, some critical thinking questions. Like, why does this herb do this? Explain why, um, you know, why, why does Mahuang promote urination? The answer is not because it's a diuretic, that would be the Western answer, but when we get to Mahuang, we'll talk about why. Um, yeah. So uh, in Introduction to Herbs, Introduction to Herbs is hard, but it's hard for a very different reason than Herbs 1, 2, et cetera are. In Introduction to Herbs, everything's new, and everything's different. Like each herb is its own little microcosm that you have to memorize. And frankly, at least for me, excuse me, it didn't make the most sense. I learned Ma Huang and then Gui Zhe, and then we're right on to the cool, cool herbs. There's not a whole lot of context for those. I understand, you know, oh, they, they're going to work for wind heat conditions. They're going to help vent the exterior. You know, Gui Zhe is going to help warm the interior, unblock the heart yang, sure. But now we've already moved on to the next herbs. And so it's challenging because you're having to constantly learn these new broad concepts and these herbs with a lot of information. In Herbs 1, we're going to be focusing, Herbs 1 is hard because everything is similar. So this becomes particularly challenging around week 7 when we get into the clear heat resolve toxicity herbs, where we're going to go over about 30 herbs that all look decently similar. And what's going to be important is what it is that makes them different. So um, you all learned Ma Huang and Gui Zhe in Introduction to Herbs, right? Did you guys cover Ma Huang? Or have you stopped covering that in Intro to Herbs? I know that's been back and forth. You did cover it, okay. So when we're talking about Ma Huang and Gui Zhe, warm acrid release exterior is fairly straightforward. These are two slightly different variations on a the theme. Today we're gonna cover, I think about 12 herbs. 
that are all similar but a little bit different. So here we're going to be going over the subtleties, and that's what I'm going to be testing you on. Um, so it's going to be less questions like, you know, which herb clears heat, uh, which herb is used for wind cold invasions without sweating, and it's going to be more things like which herb is used if you have a wind cold invasion but also a sinus headache or wind cold invasion but also facial swelling or wind cold invasion but also your patient has a weak digestive system um, to learn this information there's some sections of density that you may not have interacted with yet that are going to be really important when you look at each chapter in Bensky, there are the big chapters, like the release exterior chapter, and then there are the subsections, like warm acrid release exterior and cool acrid release exterior. At the beginning of each of, each of those sections, they have a little bit of information about what the section looks like. And at the end of the chapter, they have a summary of the comparative functions, where they're gonna go through, like Ma Huang, Guizhi, and Qixin are relatively strong they're gonna go through and compare all of the herbs from these categories. This is a nice place to go to get a summary of the whole thing. I've included the information that you usually get at the beginning of each chapter in the notes that I just sent to all of you. Yeah, just switch us over to that really quick. So we're gonna be, every week, you're gonna have notes that look like this, name, which is up in the chat. You all should have this now. Warm acrid herbs that release the exterior. The first page is what the chapter in general, what the section in general looks like. And then we're gonna go through each herb one by one. Um, I put this up in word format so that you can type your own notes in here if you want. Whatever works best for you, I don't really care. Everything that's on this page is fair game for testing. I expect you to know everything on every single one of these pages, up, down, back, forth, side to side, in, in reverse. I expect you to know the opinion. I expect you to know the Latin. Um, we'll talk about what I expect for dosage and contraindications. Everything else I expect you to know completely. This is um, this week's stuff that I expect you to memorize. Peter, oh. will we, moving, moving forward, will we have these before the class that we're covering them in? Uh, yeah, yeah, you, okay. you will. Um, they're supposed to be up on the Moodle, but they're not. Okay, cool. You can also, the syllabus that's currently up on the Moodle does have a list of all of the herbs we're covering this semester. And this information is just copied straight out of Bensky. What I've done in, these, in this file is tried to remove most of the stuff in Bensky that is not what I'm going to test you on. A lot of that information is useful as well, and I'm going to talk about it in class. But I wanted to give you, if you want to make flashcards, I don't know how you want to study these things. I recommend flashcards. It works well for me but this is the stuff that is fair game for testing. And the other stuff is fair game for like extra credit. And this is, yeah, every week. This week is relatively light. Um, if you know all of this information for every herb, you will ace your boards and your comps. It's a lot of information. Well, that might be a little bit daunting. Does that make sense to everybody? You guys with me? I've lost all of you. Okay. Peter, while you're looking for that, just um, I got kicked out of Zoom a couple times, so the chat has erased whatever you sent, but we can find this on the Slack channel, right? Yes, I will have everything okay. up on the Slack channel every week. All right, cool. Thank um, you. And my plan is to have that largely populated by the end of the weekend. Yeah, so mo pretty much everything should be up on Slack by the end of the weekend for every week. I might change some of it as we go, but I'm not gonna change anything that you're getting tested on. These files that I showed, like these lecture notes, when we use them, might change a little bit, but the file with the where file, the warm acrid release exterior file, isn't gonna change, same for the other weeks. And those are all done, so that'll be up shortly. Okay. Word format is great. Good, glad you like it so much. Um, okay, this is what our schedule looks like. 
So today we're doing an intro and we're starting the warm acrid release exterior herbs. We'll see how far we get. Uh, weeks two through five, we're learning herbs. That's all we're doing. Um, if we get through the herbs we're supposed to cover in a week, I would love it if we could get slightly ahead um, so that we just have a little bit of buffer room. If we're able to get ahead, then I can bring in some other information as well, which might be a little bit harder to get otherwise. But uh, what matters the most is that you guys are getting this, this basic info. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Again, ask questions. Nobody left behind on this. So yeah. Week six, we're gonna have a midterm. I have not written this midterm yet. Again, this is the first time I'm teaching this type of material in this format. I've taught this material before, just not in this format. Um, so I'm probably gonna be writing the midterm like week four and we'll review it beforehand. I'll tell you exactly what you need to know, but it's gonna look a lot like that Word file I just sent you, except six of them. And then seven through nine, we're learning more herbs, and then you got your final. If we have time at the end, we're gonna go over how to, um, some herb preparation techniques, but that's not wildly important to do right now. We're gonna go over some individual herbs and how to prepare them um, when there's special stuff as we go through. That's the whole thing. We're gonna have quizzes most weeks. Um, yeah, we, we, have, we have a quiz pretty much every week. Uh, the, you can't fall behind on this material. There's a lot to memorize every week and you've got to put it into long-term storage. So next week, we're gonna have a quiz on warm acrid release exterior up to whatever point we get to this week. And then going forward, every week is gonna be 90% what we covered the week before and 10% old stuff. So I would recommend every week spending a minute reviewing what's coming before. I'll try to give you hints about what I'm gonna include. I'm gonna be keeping an eye out for what people are getting wrong on the quizzes every week so I can bring those back, those questions back. And then the midterm and the final are both going to be very long. And we're gonna be, it's gonna be quite inclusive of what we've covered. Um, so let's get into what you need to know. The basics of what you need to know is just what's in that um, that Word file that I just sent you. I already have all those Word files made. Those will be up in the Slack tomorrow. Um, but as you're learning this, what I recommend you learn is the category information, which is the first page on every one of those slides. You need to know what the general characteristics of the herb in the category are. When we're talking about warm, acrid, release exterior herbs, that's pretty straightforward because they're generally warm and acrid. Um, the first page of each of the chapters in Bensky and each of the sections in Bensky will help you understand the general um, expectations that what, what you're gonna be seeing within that area, within that category. Um, yeah, so you need to know the general category stuff. That's free game from me too. If I say to you, what conditions are generally treated by warm acrid release exterior herbs, I need you to be able to say wind cold. I need you to be able to pick that out of multiple choice. Not yet, because we haven't covered it yet, but in general. Um, after that, you need to know the individual herbs. And when you're learning the individual herbs, I recommend um, picturing this in your head almost like the category is a box, and then all of the herbs are existing within that box, and they're all variations on the theme. So we're gonna have a bunch of warm acrid release exterior herbs that we learned today that are for wind cold. And then we're gonna have a couple that are for wind cold if there's also dampness, or wind cold if there's also this, or also this. We get to clear heat resolve toxicity. Is the toxicity in the liver? Is the toxicity in the heart? Is the toxicity in the stomach? Is it in the skin? Is it in the sinews? So these sorts of distinctions are gonna be important. So what we care about in this class most is learning how to figure out what the differences between the herbs are so that you know what, which herb, what each herb specializes in. These herbs are not interchangeable in general. If someone comes in and I don't have the right herbs for them, it's a little hard to just substitute something else in. You can, but that's much further along. Each herb has its unique thing it does, and we have very few repeats. Um, so these are the sort of questions down here at the bottom of this slide that uh, are, are fair game based on the information that's in the document I already sent you. So which ones treat headache? Which are suitable for weak patients? which are gonna be used for strong patients, which are for patients with wind cold, with internal cold at the same time. Um, yeah. 
this making sense to you guys so far? Just give me a little nod or shake of your head. Okay, great. Uh, what does WHERE stand for? Uh, that's, that's a good question. I, um, I find it's very helpful to actually physically write things out for memorization. If you find that useful, you need shorthand for this stuff because writing warm acrid release exterior 500 times takes a long time. So I have abbreviated every single category into four letters or less. So where is warm acrid released exterior? Care is cold, ac cool acrid released exterior. DD is drain damp. Yeah, uh, we, we've got all of them right here. They'll be spelled out every semester on the, um, in these actual word files that I'm sending you. I have the whole thing written out. So you know, when you get these files, it's gonna say warm acrid herbs that release exterior, but the file name is just gonna be where. And I recommend getting used to those things. It's not a standard way of doing it, but it is common. Um, and it just makes conversations about this stuff easier. Shorthand is your friend when you're gonna write the same thing a thousand times. That makes sense? Great. Okay. Oh, we're already half an hour in. Okay. Um, so this is what we're looking at. This is what the semester looks like. Pretty straightforward. Quiz every week, except for the week after the midterm. Peter, it's Marianne. Yep. Hi. So I know you said you've, you've taught this before, but just not in this format. Um, what were your tests like before? Like, okay, so when we had intro to herbs. It was like opinion, Latin, um, you know, where or care, you know, just <clears throat> describe that and if there were any contraindications, um, so on and so forth. Is it, are, do you follow a similar format or um, are they, yeah, I'm just kind of wondering. Um. I'm not positive yet. I'm, I'm going to be writing this fresh here. So um, I know what you're going to need to know for comprehensive exams and board exams, and I know what their questions look like. So mm -hmm. I'm going to attempt to mimic those questions. And then I'm going to add in a bunch of stuff like Asari Radix is what in Pinyin, and there's just a blank and you've got to write it in. Um, I'm going to actually have you guys, a lot of it is going to be multiple choice, but for things like naming, I just need you, you need to be able to spell the Latin right. You know, like, otherwise you're ordering the wrong herb sometimes. Um, yeah, so in general, this is going to be multiple choice in a way that mimics board exams and comprehensive exams. That may evolve as we go. I'm not, I, I don't believe in being tricky, except occasionally in ways that the board exams and the comprehensive exams like to be tricky. And when I do that, I'm going to make sure that I make it very clear that a trick is coming. So that you guys just get used to that. Um, but for the people who had FCM2 with me, this is me asking like, which organ relates to hair versus which organ relates to body hair because they just love asking that to make sure you get a wrong answer. Um, so have, I'd rather you get something wrong in my class and then get it right on the exams that matter much more. Will you have pictures for us to identify the herbs? I have some pictures. I also have an entire database that I got from Tom Leung from Cam Wo. Oh. I don't yet know how I'm going to get pictures into the Moodle for quizzes. Mm -hmm. This is something that I, I could answer these questions much more easily if I was giving you physical quizzes in person. Part of the question, part of my uncertainty is how to do this online in a way where I'm not just giving you homework to do at home. Okay. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm considering like sending you guys some links to just pictures of the herbs and then having question one be like identify the herb at this web address I, I i just don't quite know yet i don't i don't know how to do this in a way that's going to work well but we'll get there okay but good question keep them coming um i will be offering extra credit throughout the semester if you guys apply yourselves and if you're understanding the the material you should do well um, from what I've seen historically in herbs classes, there are A's, B's, C's, and 40%. There's not a lot of people who are right on the cusp. It tends to be a pretty quick drop off. Um, hopefully that doesn't happen to anyone here. I will do my best to make sure you all are well prepared and are able to handle this. So, covered this. 
like that. Okay, um, we need to talk about a couple things that you may not have learned yet that I can talk to you about how Bensky organized his book so that this makes a little bit more sense. When we look at, all right, the chat keeps disappearing on me. Got a couple messages here. Uh, oh, yeah, great. Thanks, Nelson. Um, so when we're looking at this document that I sent to you, the where document, the order of the herbs here is the same order that they're in Bensky. He does not organize his chapters randomly. There's a reason there that the herbs are in the chat. The herbs in each chapter are in the order that they're in, and you're going to start recognizing patterns as you go through it. I just want to introduce you to those patterns right away because it should help you memorize these things. And to do that, we're going to have to talk for one second about how herbal formulas get made. So when you're designing it, you're not getting tested on anything in the slides, and I'm you're not getting tested on this. Um, but I just want you to get this idea in your head. When you design a herbal formula, there's four roles that have to be filled. Each role can be filled with multiple herbs. You have the chief herb or herbs, and that herb is the one that most accurately reflects what you're trying to do with the formula. Ma Huang and everything you learned in introduction to herbs is a chief herb. All of them are chiefs, pretty much. We also have herbs that function as deputies. Deputies tend to assist the chief in the function with a little bit of modification. So for example, if you have Ma Huang as your chief, Guajir makes a good deputy. They play well together. They're doing more or less kind of in the same realm of the same thing. We also have assistants. Assistants can do all sorts of stuff. So sometimes you'll have a hot herb as your chief and you'll have a cold herb as your assistant to make sure that the hot herb doesn't damage the person's system. This is where we get rid of all the side effects that the formula might cause. This is where you balance out and harmonize the formula so that the person takes it and experiences nothing but benefit. Sometimes a formula moves up too much and we're worried that like, yeah, this is great. We're gonna help the person with their low energy, but we might give them insomnia because we're moving all this chi up to their head. So we're gonna add in an herb that helps to pull back down. So it's 90% up with a little bit of down. That down is gonna be showing up as an assistant. And lastly, we have envoys. Envoys are optional. Envoys help in directing the formula to a particular place or in harmonizing the formula. Um, licorice is the most common envoy that we have. It's in about half of our herbal formulas. Don't worry about knowing this at too deep of a level, but Bensky has, herbal, has organized his chapters somewhat along the lines of this chief deputy assistant envoy structure. So the first herbs in every single section and in every single chapter are the herbs that are the clearest exemplars of the title of the chapter. So when you say warm acrid relief exterior, you think ma huang, you think guajir, those are the first two herbs in the sec section. This is gonna be true for every single section in the book. The first herbs you see are usually the most commonly used herbs, the highest dosage herbs relative to what their normal dosage are, is, there are herbs that you're going to see in the title, in the names of formulas. Ma Huang, when we use that in a formula, the most common formula it's in is Ma Huang Tang. There's other herbs in that formula, but we name it after the chief very frequently. So when you open a chapter, you're generally looking at chiefs. And you've learned a bunch of these already. They're our most famous ones. After the chiefs, he goes into the other herbs that are also chiefs, but less frequently or from a slightly different herbal tradition or from a different time in history or for a weird variation on it. So within the warm acrid relief exterior category, that's gonna be Jing Jie and Feng Feng, which we'll get to in just a minute. So they might be a little bit of an odd version of what we're treating with the herbs you learned in introduction to herbs, but these are also major herbs that often get title positions. So Jing Feng Baidu Song is Jing Jie and Feng Feng as chiefs within a formula for example. So you're going to start off with the herbs that most closely resemble the section, the chapter you're in. You're going to follow that up with ones that pretty closely resemble it, but with a little bit of variation. And then you're going to start getting into deputies. These are, these are herbs that never get the title cards. These are never the famous ones. These are the supporting actors of the herbal world. These are herbs that tend to look decently like what the chapter is about, but then have a dis an additional function. So these are herbs like Gaobun and Baijiu, 
Spiger works for wind cold invading the body with some dampness if there's sinus problems. So if you're gonna use Ma Huang to treat someone's wind cold invasion and they also have sinus congestion, we might be adding Baijiu to the formula so that we can unblock the sinus at the same time. After the deputies, we get assistance and abnormal cases. Two of the clearest ones of that in the warm acrid release exterior category are Shengjiang, ginger, which is in Ma Huang Tang, it's in Guizhou Tang. And we've got, oh, sorry, it's just in uh, Guizhou Tang, it's not in Ma Huang Tang. Um, and we've got Xiang Ru, which is a herb for wind cold invasions that happen in the summer because someone drinks too much cold beverage or spends too much time in front of air conditioning. It's for a very specific version of a wind cold. That's not common. When we think of wind colds, we think about someone who's exposed to cold weather. We think about someone who's been out in the elements. We think about conditions that people don't get in August in New York, except that some people spend all of August drinking ice water and sitting in front of an air conditioner. And when they get the wind cold, it doesn't look like a normal wind cold. It looks different. And so we start looking to an herb like Xiang Ru, it's a, a weird manifestation. Xiang Ru's nickname is Summertime Ma Huang. So as we keep going through the chapter, um, Ma Huang and Guizhou are the first two herbs, Jingjie and Fang Fang are the next two herbs, Gao Ban and Bai Zhe are in the next few herbs, Sheng Zhang and Xiang Ru come later. And in the end of every chapter, and at the end of every, end of most chapters and most sections, we have the herbs that Bensky went, who the hell knows where this goes? And he took his best guess for where they should go to make sense, and he put them there. There are some er uh, in the first edition of his Materia Medica, he had a section that was herbs that treat summer heat. That section no longer exists. All of those herbs have been moved to other categories. There's some herbs that are like, this herb treats headaches. That's the end of the story. It doesn't do anything else. It's not fancy. It doesn't integrate, it doesn't have a beautiful story. It's like, well, yeah, so, I mean, if they have an external invasion, a headache, like toss three grams of this and it'll help with the headache. In this case, Feng Bai would be a good example of this. That's scallion. Scallions are really more food than they are herbs. Yeah, there's an herbal formula where you use aged tofu along with Feng Bai for really early stage wind cold invasions in the elderly. But like, I think if you went to Cam Wo and you asked them for scallions, they'd tell you to go next door to the herbal market, to the food store. Like this is, it's a little bit of a different category. In Xin Yi, which unblocks the sinuses, and that's it. It has one function, done and over. So it's not really a warm acrid release exterior herb, except it happens to be warm and acrid, but all it does is affect the sinuses. If you've got a wind cold, Xin Yi will not get rid of it. So the end of every section and every chapter can feel a little like, what am I even looking at? How does this fit into this chapter? Why is this in this chapter? And the answer often is, it had to go somewhere and this is the closest we've got. So if you feel confused about the herbs at the end of sections, you are correct. Does that make sense to everybody? This should help navigate some of these chapters a little bit. You guys with me? Good. Okay. Uh, we're gonna spend a minute going over herb qualities. This should take about 15 minutes, and then we'll take a break, and then we're gonna start learning herbs today. So herbs have flavors. Herbs have temperatures, and herbs have other qualities that get attributed to them. I'm not going to spend much time on the other today. Herbs can be sour, bitter, acrid, sweet, salty, and bland. Those are six flavors, and the temperatures range from very cold to very hot. We're going to dis discuss the distinctions between warm, hot, and very hot as we look at specific herbs that have those qualities, and we're going to discuss the difference between cool, cold, and very cold when we look at herbs that have those qualities. Oftentimes when you're treating a patient, the correct way to make their herbal formula is picking between two very similar herbs when one is cool and one is very cold. And picking the wrong one, if the patient needs a very cold herb and you give them a cool herb, the formula might just not work. If the patient needs a cool herb and you give them a very cold herb, you might wreck their spleen and they have diarrhea for a moment. So you have to weigh out how aggressive you want the temperature modification that the herbs are imparting to the patient to be. Sour is going to be drawing inwards. When you think sour, think the sort of sucking in face that you get when you bite into a lime. 
we're going to use sour for working with constraint and working with leakage. So people who are really tight, lots of livery conditions, and people who aren't tight enough, people who are leaking things outwards. We're not going to talk about a lot of sour herbs in this semester, but when you get into, I guess, herbology too, you're going to be introduced to the um, stop coughing and wheezing herbs. There's a bunch of herbs that stop sweating. All of those are going to be sour. If you need to affect the liver, if you need to affect tendons, if you need to affect the gallbladder, you're probably going to be looking for an herb that's sour. It may also be other things, but you're probably going to be looking for some sour herbs. And I mean, sour is pretty straightforward, but we're going to have a flavor reference for each of these because some are less intuitive. Bitter drains downwards, and it can also direct to the blood or to the heart. So if a patient has a heart-related condition, uh, constraint, chi stagnation. Just think chi stagnation. Yes, it is the opposite of leakage. Well, it'll make more sense as we get to the herbs involved with that. Um, so oftentimes we use sour to soften the liver when the liver's too tight, but we also use sour to pull things inward when they're leaking out too much. It can do both. We'll get to that. Generally, if you're working with too much constraint, you're using a combination of sour and acrid together. These, these flavors combined. So bitter can also direct to the blood and the heart. So if someone has especially a heat condition in the heart, the first thing you're thinking is a bitter cooling herb to take care of that. We're gonna be using bitter for all sorts of mental state issues that involve excess, especially if heat is involved. So people who have anxiety, mania, panic attacks, very often we're gonna be looking at bitter herbs to treat those things. All of these are gross generalizations. The specifics get more complicated. But when you think bitter, you're thinking dandelion greens. Dandelion is actually one of, um, I think it's an underrated herb. We'll get to that later this semester. I think uh, quite a few people should be consuming it on a regular basis. Uh, collard greens and uh, Angostura bitters. So anyone here who's been a bartender or who makes cocktails at home, Angostura bitters contains within it uh, what herb? Anyone know? Feel free to put it in the chat. Or just say it. So Angostura bitters contains gentian root or gentian, which is a Chinese and Western herb. We're going to get to that in the clear heat drain fire category later this semester. It is used for excess heat in the liver. If you look at the beverage, uh, the cocktail and old fashioned, whiskey will add heat to the liver. The bitters will drain the heat right out of it. It's a traditional way of making a cocktail with the treatment for the damage the alcohol causes in the cocktail itself except the modern version then also has a ton of sugar, which isn't great. If we look at sweet herbs, the sweet flavor, if you see sweet, you know we're tonifying something. We're building something up within the person. That's sweet's function, pretty much end of story. So if we have a deficient patient, at some point, they're gonna be given sweet herbs. We may have to do other things first. We may have to build up aspects of them, but. If someone's chi deficient, we're probably giving them sweet herbs. If they're blood deficient, we're probably giving them sweet herbs. If they're yin deficient, there's really no way to treat that without sweet herbs. For someone who's yang deficient, we tend to just give them very hot herbs. But for everything else, we're, we're looking at sweet. And when we say sweet, we don't mean Coca-Cola sweet. We mean sweet potato, rice milk, licorice, date. That's the sort of sweet we're talking about. It's a little bit more of a complex sweet flavor. And um, rice is considered to be sweet. It's going to be considered to be sweet and bland, but we're not necessarily talking about like modern refined sugar. We're not necessarily talking about sugar cane that would be considered to be extremely sweet. So sweet is, the, the bar for sweet is a lot lower than contemporary culture. Acrid is going to move or disperse things. If something's stuck, if a patient has stagnation, we're probably looking at acrid as the flavor that we're using. So a patient who has a lot of constraint due to liver-related issues, we might be looking at herbs that are both sour and acrid, like chai hu, which you learned last semester, I think. Um, or you may be looking at herbs that are acrid and bitter or sour and bitter. If a patient has food stagnation, if they have stress, phlegm, bloating, pain, I mean, bloating, pain, stress, those are all just cheese stagnation, right? Might be other things too, but it's at least cheese stagnation. Um, so if you, if you hear stagnation, you think acrid. In terms of flavors, acrid tastes like radishes more than anything else. 
Um, when you go to a taco restaurant and you get tacos and they come with slices of radish on the side, the radish is there to aid in the digestion of the food. When you get sushi and it comes with wasabi, the wasabi, well, I mean, it's almost all green colored horseradish, but close enough. The acrid food, the acrid um, wasabi that comes with the sushi is there to aid in the digestion of the sushi traditionally. That's what it's there for. A lot of the traditional food combinations, which might not necessarily make a ton of sense on a flavor, on a palate level, are there to make other aspects of the food work better. Rosemary would be another example of acrid. Mustard greens would be acrid and bitter. Salty as a flavor is going to soften hardness or direct inwards. So a lot of herbs are going to act superficially and we'll be adding salt to draw the function of those herbs into the person's body at a deeper level. So if you see an herb that's sweet and salty, there's a good chance that you're going to be building up physical substances, good chance you're going to be built, tonifying the kidneys with that. So salty becomes a key flavor for the kidneys and for essence. We're also going to use salty if we're working with things like cysts or fibroids or any other sort of physical growth, because that saltiness almost works like sandpaper, breaking these things down, dissolving them. If it sounds a little bit hyperbolic to say that we're going to start breaking down cysts and fibroids with herbs, we do it so fast, it's silly. I've had plenty of patients come in with ultrasounds, with a diameter given to them by their OBGYN, They've had multiple cysts or multiple fibroids removed over the past years through surgery. They know how this cycle goes. Their fibroids don't shrink. We get them on herbs for a few weeks, they get another ultrasound and their cysts are halfway gone. We're, we're good at this. When we say salty, basically all meat is considered salty within Chinese medicine. And, uh, but to take it a step further, we'd be talking about things like shellfish. We're talking about herbal medicine, um, any of like longu and muli, which I believe you learned in Intro to Herbs, are both salty. They both have a little bit of a dissolving hardness function. In addition to this, herbs have directionality or a tropism. Or some herbs go to organs. Some herbs are better at directing to organs than others. So a sour food that enters the liver is going to work a little bit differently than a sour food, food which enters the kidney. Um, and they also tend to affect the tissue associated with the organ. We'll look at that on the next slide. Some herbs go to areas. We've got herbs that direct an herbal formula to the low back. We've got herbs that direct to the shoulder. So when we're talking orthopedics, when we're talking about internal herbal medicine for orthopedic conditions, you have a patient who just had surgery on their low back who's coming in because they've got massive blood stagnation there. But the rest of them is really deficient. We don't want to move all of the blood in their body, we want to focus in on an area, we'll be looking for herbs to help draw this to a specific place so that we're not causing side effects. Good herbal medicine does not have side effects, with some exceptions. In addition to going to areas, some herbs go in a direction. You guys learn Chai Hu, which goes up, and you learn Longu and Muli, which both go downwards. So you have a patient with insomnia, you're probably going to be using herbs which go downwards. You have a patient who can't wake up in the morning, who always has a fuzzy head, who's always tired, you're probably using herbs which go upwards. If you want to do something, if you have a patient who comes in with, uh, whose vision is slowly degrading, who has blurry vision, who has liver blood deficiency, which is the most common diagnosis for blurry vision due to overwork, we might be using herbs which go in and tonify the liver blood, but we might be adding in herbs which draw that up to the eyes to make sure that we're emphasizing the effect of those herbs in the exact tissue where the main problem is manifesting. Does that make sense? Peter? Yeah. I, I, I'm sorry. I feel like I'm like asking all these questions. I'm sorry, class. Um, no, no, it's good. Ask so, questions. Please ask questions. So, you know, this is, I wondered about this. So when we're studying herbology and we have to, we're going to be learning about contraindications when we yep. see patients they may have um, prescription medication and yep. there could be direct contraindications with those medicines or those or particular family of medicines how do we bridge that is that something we'll learn later on in herbs classes so um in single herbs you should not be i generally recommend people who are healthy should sample the herbs that they're learning in single herbs so they get familiar with them, but you should not be giving any of these herbs to anybody else. 
-hmm. and you should not be giving them in large doses to yourself because mm -hmm. all of the information about how to do this safely comes in the formulas classes because we don't use single herbs. We don't give people one herb in Chinese mm -hmm. medicine. Almost never happens. There's like three exceptions out of the 700 herbal formulas that are, you know, that we work with. Of the 200 you'll learn, but like this massive number that we work with overall, we just don't do single herbs. So right now you're getting the foundation to then go to the place where you can learn those sorts of things. Like I'm and really that's not until the Chim class. Okay. So until after the formulas classes where you really get into like your patients on statin, but they still have high blood pressure. What do you do? How do you not cause bleeding? You'll get there. Okay. Don't worry about it for now. Okay. Yeah. Cause and, you mentioned licorice earlier is in about 40% of the formulas. And I, I do know that licorice can mm -hmm. elevate blood pressure for, so I don't know if it would be, you know, if it's in a formula, like if it's such a minute amount that it wouldn't contraindicate somebody with hypertension who might be on also on blood thinners, so on and so forth. That's yeah. So I was generally we're, we, if you have a patient who's on a lot of prescription medications and who is at risk of a serious health event, be that a heart attack, a stroke, if they have a history of these things, unless you have specially trained in working with that sort of patient population, you shouldn't go anywhere near them with herbs, ever. The amount of licorice we have in herbal formulas is generally low enough that if that's gonna damage your patient, then they're probably gonna get damaged by putting hot sauce on their dinner too. So you probably shouldn't be working with them with any herbs anyways, just for liability reasons, you shouldn't be working with them with herbs, unless you're specifically trained in working with that patient population. Yeah, okay. most herbal formulas that have licorice have 1.5 to three grams of licorice in them. It's an amount that just doesn't, it doesn't matter for their overall health. Um, yeah. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah, yeah, this, you will not be asked to give people herbs until you're comfortable with that information. No, this is, this, we, we take that, we take that seriously. I take that seriously. Okay, um, so the last thing here, I just wanna look at this really quick. So um, when we're talking about how these herbs work, we're often talking about these multi-step interactions. So um, if we're talking about a sour herb that goes to the liver, that might be good for muscle cramps, helping to relieve constraint within the tissue associated with the liver. If your patient comes in and they've got weak muscles, we might be looking at sweet herbs that go to the liver. This is, again, a little bit of an oversimplification, but I want you to begin thinking this way because I'm gonna be teaching you herbs in part in this manner. Um, if a patient comes in with dry skin due to fluid deficiency, we're probably gonna be looking for a sweet herb that goes to the lungs, assuming that they don't have a complex case, assuming that all this is is lung yin or lung fluid deficiency, we give them an herb like maimandong, which I think you learned in Intro to Herbs, right? We give them an herb like maimandong, it can help to, um, to moisten the skin. This is one of the reasons why that five element chart, which I'll send out to everyone, I, you guys have all seen the five element charts. This is one of the reasons those are important because you need to be able to bounce around those really quickly when organizing this information. I referred to it as kind of like the scales on a piano for Chinese medicine. You just gotta know it, you gotta practice. Okay, that's our introduction. Um, we're gonna take a 10 minute break and come back at 7.30. I will be here and I will answer questions. I'll be walking around, but I've got wireless headphones so I can answer questions. Um, and then we're going right into warm acrid release exterior and we're gonna start learning. Does that sound good to everybody? This is fast. I would normally, I would like to do this slightly slower, but it's fast, we got a lot to cover. Um, sorry, one second. I'm Oops, someone. Oh. Um, someone's asking for the five element chart. Yeah, sure, I'll just put it up in the Slack, no problem. Um, when is the second break? Uh, uh, this class goes till 9.15, is that correct? Um, an hour from when we get back with five minute margin of error. Yeah. I was actually gonna ask, cause like, I think the schedule has to end at 8.15, but that doesn't make sense because two hours is not enough time for each class. Does the schedule say that? I mean, I think yeah. this should be a 14 week class. I think it's this supposed to be this term. That's what I was told, because uh, I just switched over to MSTOM. And okay. um, I think it was Kendrick had said that this was, 
this time herbs one was 14 weeks it's just shorter every night that's why i think wow. it says 8 8 15 uh stop time okay well i was told to design a 10-week course with three hours each week so does anyone have an objection to going three hours today if you have an objection, you can message me privately in the chat if you don't want to say it publicly. And if I get one of those messages, I'm not going to ask you to do things that we did not, uh, that people didn't sign up for. And I'll talk to the school and figure out what's going on. Okay, we have someone with an objection. So we're just going to go, I guess we're just going two hours tonight. Let me, uh, okay, we're on break right now. You have 10 minutes. I'm going to try to answer this question right now and get back to you guys in just a minute, okay? Um, to the person who's asking when they're allowed to eat, I don't care if you eat on camera, it doesn't bother me. Um, if, if you need to turn off your camera because it bothers other people, I know it bothers people sometimes, I, that's fine with me too. Okay, so uh, it says here 6.15 to 8.45, so it's two and a half hours. That's not less weird. Okay, well, we'll go to 8.45 today. So you have 10 minutes now. And that's probably our only break. And if anyone has questions, feel free to ask them. Hey, Peter, are you still there? It's Kyria. Yep, I'm here. Okay, cool. Um, I wanted to know about um, like just study stuff in general. That's always helpful for me because I'm just trying to figure out. Yeah. yeah. So the things that you sent or you have in Slack, which are great, we can, you recommend like printing those out, like marking them up or like translating them into index cards and doing it like that. Like what would you recommend? Yeah, I mean, I, I sent it out as a Word document so you can write into yeah. it if you want to. Um, Mm -hmm. but you can also print it out. I would recommend making flashcards out of it. You need to know all of the information that's in the document I sent you, and you're going to get a document this length or longer every week. So um, what I did when I was in school was I made two flashcards for every herb. One of them had the pinion and Latin on the front, and on the back it had the uh, temperatures and channels, and then I made another one which just had the Mandarin on the front, and then it had all the functions on the back in the Latin. And I needed to be able to go in both directions. So I needed to be able to look at the back of the card, look at the functions and the Latin and guess the, the pinion. And I needed to be able to go from the pinion and get all the others. Just rote going is gonna help for a while. And then once you become conversational with them, it should be also somewhat logical. I'll be trying to throw in some, um, some like little bits of information like Ophiopagonus radix is the Latin for Maimondong, which you learned in semester in Intro to Herbs. Ophiopagonus means snake beard. And Maimondong is named that because it's it's a lateral tuber off of the main tuber. And it looks, if you hold up the actual plant, like a bunch of little raisins dangling off of it. And they the people who named it thought it looked like a snake beard. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden you'll never forget Ophiopagonus. Yeah. So fun um, stuff like that. Um, but I guess, why were you doing it in Mandarin? Were you learning Mandarin or? Well, oh, oh just the, the, the pinyin, not character. Oh, oh, okay, but okay, like, sorry. Yeah, I, was yeah, just like... I mean, yeah. Like we're not, uh, it, it isn't really Mandarin because we're not doing the tones or the accents. Like if you were, right. if you walk into an, a, not Cam Wo, but a really Mandarin speaking herbal pharmacy, I can't order most of these herbs because I don't know the tones for them. Mm -hmm. So just real quick, so, Jing, yeah, they're gonna look at me like I'm crazy. Um, so wait, just one more time with the, with the cards. On the one cards, you'd have the pin, the Latin and the pinion, and then on the back, you'd have the channels and the temperature. I'm just trying to like to learn your hack. Yeah. Um, that's what I did. Uh, so and the other card you have, able, you need to be able to get from the name to the temperatures and the channels and you need to be able to get from the name to the functions. And you need to be able to do both of those things in the other direction too. So- Wait, but what about the categories? To, like, what, like the categories? You're gonna study categories as a group. 
Mm -hmm. So I would recommend doing all of the warm acrid release exterior together and then binder clip or pa paper clip mm -hmm. that together and you study those as a group and you study each chapter as a group so that you, they, you learn them in relation to each other, in relationship to each other so that if something shows up, at the very least, you should be like, I don't remember Gao Bun at all. I don't remember a single thing about it, except that I know I study that when I study Ma Huang. So I know mm -hmm. the I know the chapter, I, I know the category. If you know the category, you just got forty percent of the questions right, mm -hmm. right there. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to be a little bit. I'm going to push you guys a little bit further than that, but yeah, okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, sorry, I'd be redundant with this, but I just wanted. To add, <laughs> okay, and with your second card, just so I'm clear, your second card would have on the back like that would have the. Mandarin or the pinion only on the front and then on the back would have the functions. Yep, that's, okay. that's what I did. Is that um, okay. And what, what I usually, what I did when I was initially learning this stuff, like first pass, was mm -hmm. I made myself actually write out the answer. So I wouldn't just say it or think it, I'd either mm -hmm. verbalize it or write it down on paper. Because mm -hmm. the act of doing that, so you're, you're combining like the visual aspect of the learning with the thinking, with the speaking, with the writing, all of that comes together. So you're, you're, you're engaging as many of your senses as possible into the memorization process. Okay, so that, got it. So, I, so you, yeah. when you were quizzing yourself, you actually like had paper and would be like, this is what I think it is. I probably like, wrote 2,500 pages of notes yeah. okay. practicing this stuff. Um, that you throw away. <laughs> you know, they're not like yeah, comprehensive yeah, yeah. notes. They're not, just it's like... just scratch. So like when I studied for um, boards and comps, I mean, I, I can show these notes to you guys at some point. Um, I made full pages, like one single full page, fairly small print, almost all fill in the blank for myself to study that included 70 herbs on one page. I'm, I got my shorthand down to the point that it was just a string of nonsense letters to anybody else, but I could fit every single detail about each herb onto one line of a sheet of paper. And I would just generate that entire sheet over and over again until I didn't get anything wrong on the sheet. And that five, six sheets, that's your entirety of the single herbs program. Mm -hmm. I'm not recommending you do that. I went a little crazy, but developing a little bit of shorthand makes the writing easier. Writing where is a lot easier than warm make or release exterior 50 times. Um, mm -hmm. And then as this goes on, change it in ways that seem to work better for you. Like each person is going to be different, but you do need a systematic approach and you do need to be able to keep developing it and changing. Right, okay, well, that's helpful. That makes sense. And you yeah, also wanna develop a database of study materials so that when you get to the point where you're gonna study for comprehensive exam one, where you need all of the single herbs, you already have your study materials. You don't have to go back and regenerate four semesters, three semesters of herbal information. Right, so with that part, like, were you doing like study blue, like the in, or were you doing like Microsoft Word and just like documents? Or were you doing like um, I, everything handwritten? Just all everything else, oh, right? You're old school. Okay. I, it, it works for me. I know other people mm -hmm. who had like um, hyperlinked documents where they had everything combined together, and you could like, there were some people who had a programming background, and it's like you click one thing on an herb and it generates a list of every herb that has that word. Oh, wow. Um, well, yeah, I just, think, I just think about like, what if like there's a fire, like water damage or a fire, it's like all your car index cards are gone, like all your study stuff is gone, that part always like, I think that's why I'm like, maybe it's good to write it down somewhere. Um, yeah. Or no, or have it somewhere on the computer or in a database or something. Yeah, I mean, at the end of the day, you have these documents from me that have the information, but I took all of this out of Bensky. Like I complain about Machiocha, I'm not a big fan of Deadman. Bensky nailed it. He did a great job. His books are good. Um, mm -hmm. Everything you need is in there. Uh, really, the biggest challenge with Bensky is stripping out the information you don't need. Right, right. Um, so, you know, everything lights on fire. Um, at the end of the day, you have everything you need to regenerate this information. <laughs> okay. And frankly, copying this over and over is part of the studying process. You just don't want to be at the point where you're at comps one and you're searching to find the information. You're still going to be regenerating it, but you don't want to be like, God, where do I get that? Or mm -hmm. spending, you know, an entire weekend flipping through Bensky trying to figure it out. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think we're going to be probably as we get 
in like week three, I'm going to put half an hour. So after one quiz, after you guys have looked at this once, I'm going to put something like half an hour into going over um, how to study and different study techniques. All right, cool. And you worked on the comps. That's kind of interesting. I mean, was that like a, because you love tests or are you just like, like you were saying, you worked on the comps like board, right? Where you kind of like help with creating the tests or? I haven't helped create it. I tutored for it for years. Okay. Yeah. And I know I've gotten to see the comps um, okay. because I'm a professor at the school. Um, and I tutored for board exams. I've been asked to contribute questions to the board exams, but hmm. not anytime soon. All right, cool. That's the break. Um, um, can you just a uh, second, everybody? I'm just writing an email to the head of the herbs department asking them, what is this class? Obviously, communication was not uh, done well in this case. Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I'm happy that it's longer and that is like, you know, dank or dense. Like, I, I like the idea of it being spread out a little bit. I would much prefer this to be, when, when I realized maybe inaccurately that this was a 10 week course, I was like, that's not right. That's, it should be 14. So I think uh, Intro to Herbs was short too. Yeah. We did the final and like everyone else was still studying for other stuff. Yeah, that's true. Okay, email sent. Let's get into learning some herbs. Um, really, regardless of how this uh, class ends up looking um, in terms of hours per week, etc., we're going to be able to get through this just fine. You guys are going to have a lot of studying to do, but that's true regardless. Um, so I'm, I'm not too worried. Uh, so Leela Bob just double checked my class schedule through the student portal and says the timing is 6:15 to 8:15. 9, 10 to 10, 20. Yeah, when I pull it up, um, so I mean, I can show you guys what I see here. Uh, let me make sure that I'm not trying to be sensitive. Oh, <laughs> let me get rid of some of my patient information that's up there. Okay, so yeah, what I see here is um, that the final exam is supposed to be on week 10 based on the syllabus that they uploaded, which was based on the syllabus from last semester, which is what I was told to build a class around. And I also see this as, um, six fifteen to eight forty five. I don't have a dog in this fight. I don't care. It doesn't matter to me. Um, no matter how this turns out, it's fine. I've emailed the head of my department and the person who taught this last semester just asking what's up. So as soon as I have an answer, I will let all of you know what I have been told. Um, I have no more information. Yeah. Um, okay, people seem to like the idea of a 14 week course. I'm gonna ask the school what they're asking me to do. If they give me leeway, then I would like this class to be as long and full as possible. Frankly, I would rather have a 14 week class and we're we're moving quickly each week and you guys just have more time to study and less herbs. Like a 10 week class for herbology doesn't make sense to me because then you've got this extended break where you're not looking at herbs, which like, frankly, you just seem to keep looking at herbs forever for two years um, to, to learn this stuff. So yeah, uh, I'm, I'm glad people seem flexible. 
uh, I will be in touch with all of you. I will keep you updated as I learn information. And I'm sorry, I, I, I don't know what to tell you about this confusion. So let's start looking at, uh, let me set up my computer here for this next section. So um, I would like all of you to have this file up so that you can edit it, work in it. If you don't want to, but that's up to you. But I would recommend as we begin talking about these herbs that you have this space to write in. I'm gonna move fairly quickly through the herbs that you covered in Intro to Herbs. We're not gonna spend much time on Mahong and Guizhou. Uh, you're gonna cover them in more detail when you get to formulas. So for now, we're just gonna review them a little bit quickly. Let's start by talking about warm acrid herbs that release the exterior in general. So the way I've organized these pages is that um, in general, I have the most common temperature most common flavors, and then I have the secondary things that show up. So in addition to being acrid, a number of the herbs are bitter and sweet, and then a couple of the herbs are other things. But get, if, if you were given a random herb that you've never learned before, and you were told this is from the warm acrid release exterior category, and you were given a multiple choice exam that asked, what's the temperature? You should probably put warm, and if warm isn't an option, you should put slightly warm. And for the flavors, you should probably put acrid. And if acrid and bitter is an option, maybe that's the answer. But the answer is not sour. It's never sour. For the channels, we're looking mostly at the lung and the urinary bladder. Anyone here want to speculate as to why we're looking at the lung and the urinary bladder? Feel free to get on the mic or put it into the chat. Why, why when we're talking about external conditions, do we care about lung and urinary bladder most? Uh, methods of getting it out. Elaborate uh, either. Why, why uh, do those matter for that? So why lungs, lungs, wei chi, skin, surface, um, pushing it out, um, urinary bladder, like drain it out, like pee it out. Um. You nailed it on the lungs. Let's, uh, one more guess for the urinary bladder from somebody else. Tai Yong. Yep, Tai Yong. So warm acrid release exterior, we're talking about wind cold invasion, which means we're talking about the Shang Han Lung which means we're talking about that way of look, the six stage way of looking at diseases. So we're talking about uh, urinary bladder for that. So when we look at Ma Huang and we see lung and urinary bladder, if you see on an herb lung and urinary bladder and acrid, we're talking about the exterior, almost certainly. We might be talking about fluid physiology internally, but we're almost always talking about an external condition. Um, yeah, we'll come back to that in a second. So we are also sometimes talking about the stomach and spleen. When we're talking about the stomach and spleen, those herbs generally are also going to deal with dampness. So those are herbs that usually have wind cold invasion with some level of dampness. Uh, release exterior and expel cold, that's what the chapter does. If we want to release the exterior and expel cold, and we have no idea what we're doing, we open up Bensky to this chapter and we just start looking. Because if you, Warm acrid herbs that release exterior are going to do that for cold. Um, if we're looking uh, warm interior, especially the channels, so when the cold invades, it invades into the channels. The first symptom of a wind cold is tightness in the back of the neck, but after that we start getting headaches, we start getting sinus issues. All of this invasion is directly into the urinary bladder and dew channel in the back of the neck, and then it propagates through there, usually into the head, sometimes into the shoulders, sometimes people will get a wind cold invasion and you know they'll come into you like this in a normal week they get a wind cold invasion and they come in like this the next week everything's literally closed up back here when this person goes to a chiropractor it doesn't get better the chiropractor adjusts them two hours later they're back here because the problem is that they have cold trapped in these channels we need to use heat and acridity to get it out so when we say warm interior especially the channels this is what we're talking about we're not talking about warming the kidneys there's a whole warm interior expelled cold chapter in the book. That's a different thing. Here we're talking about cold trapped in the channels, especially the superficial channels. Expelled pathology. Sometimes other things come in with the wind cold. Sometimes other things are at the exterior. When we say warm acrid herbs that release exterior, we might be talking about things trapped on the exterior that have been vented from the inside in the first place. Like someone who has long-term dampness in the lungs might start having that manifest as eczema on the skin. 
once they're in a condition, if it's appropriate, we can use these herbs to vent measles. That's a phrase that gets used, vent ration. Some of these herbs do that. And that's what I mean here by expel pathology. Unblocking the nose is a big one. Plenty of patients, they get a wing cold. First thing that happens, first thing they notice, like maybe a little bit of a headache, maybe this, and then the nose blocks up. Urinary bladder channel coming right through this area, blocks up the flow to the nose. When the lung and the urinary bladder channel are affected, we get issues with chi transmission up and down from the head. If you guys remember the fluid physiology um, chart from FCM1 and FCM2, the lungs miss fluids up to the face. If the lungs become congested due to the effect on the skin of the cold, then we often get conditions where people get dry eyes, sinus congestion, blocked nose. We bring in this acridity and warmth, whoop, opens up. Sometimes that comes with no movement of any mucus or phlegm. Their sinus is closed for no physically apparent reason. It's just unblocked. And the last one is stop pain. Um, pain is always caused by chi stagnation and blood stagnation. Nothing else causes pain, but many things cause chi and blood stagnation. Cold causes chi and blood stagnation. So when the cold invades the channels, pain in the back of the neck, headache, occipital headache, frontal headache, all of these things are just due to pain in the channels. So when we say stop pain here, we don't mean pain in general. If someone comes in, yes, I'm gonna post recorded lectures on YouTube. I'll send you guys all the information about it. When we talk about pain in this, in this context, we're not talking about menstrual pain. We're not talking about got hit in the shoulder with a bat pain. We're talking about cold invasion pain specifically. If their pain is due to heat, this will make the pain worse, for example. The dosage of most of these herbs is what I would call the normal dosage range. Pretty much anything in the three to 15, 15 gram range, I want you to just put in your head as standard dosage. We have some herbs that are like 0.1 to 0.5, that's a low dosage herb. We have some herbs that are 15 to 50, that's a high dosage herb. You're gonna to wanna to learn the specifics of dosing, but right now, all I want from you is standard, high, or low. Most of the herbs here are in a standard range. And the contraindications for all the warm acrid release exterior herbs, most of them, are gonna be heat. Of course, you don't wanna add heat in a heat condition. Yin deficiency, because uh, the, this, all of these herbs are draining. When you're doing this, when you're causing a sweat, when you're causing the person to push this chi out and push pathology out, the person will be more deficient after you treat them than they were before. That's worth it most of the time. But if you have an 80-year-old patient who never had chi to start with, and you give them something like mothwong, you may do more damage than you do good in getting rid of their pathology. Wei chi deficiency is another issue here. If they're already sweating profusely, you generally don't want to make them sweat more. Uh, Gui jiu gets used for this a little bit in balancing out the yin and the wei. You'll mostly talk about that when you get to formulas. And when we say wei chi deficiency and we say sweating, we're kind of going hand in hand here. This is the big picture of the warm acrid release exterior category. You need to know this idea to start off, and then we're going to get we're gonna go from there into the specifics of each herb. You guys with me so far? I'm gonna be talking this fast for the whole semester. Please interrupt me and ask questions if we hit things that you have problems with. The, all of these lectures will be av available on my YouTube channel for all of you for the whole semester and probably going on after that. Reference them, go back to them. Um, yeah, I'm, I got your back in this, but we also have a lot to cover. Um, any questions before we go to my home? Yeah, I, I think I missed the part when in the expel pathology, why mucus and, and pus, why that? Sure. Um, so when we think warm acid release exterior, we're generally thinking wind cold invasion. But sometimes what we're saying is that we're using warmth and acridity to just get things out of the body, period. It doesn't have to be a wind cold. When we're talking about ma huang, when we're talking about guajir, we're mostly using those for wind cold if we're, wage is a little bit different. We're mostly using these for wind cold, but as we go down this list and we get to something like, uh, um, what's a good one here? Baija reduces swelling and expels pus. This gets used for people who have damp conditions affecting the skin with boils, with stuff that frankly we don't really see that much, but uh, for a lot of exterior conditions where you want to get, where you want to push mucus out of the body, be that from the sinuses, people with chronic sinusitis, an herb like 
uh, Fung Erza can be good. Dispels wind and dampness and opens the nasal passages. That can be a direct invasion to the nose with zero symptoms anywhere else in the person's body. If that's the case, we're gonna use this to get the nasal passages open. That might come with discharge of a whole bunch of things, including blood, depending on the reason why their nose is clogged. Got it. Yep. Okay, so let's start going through these and uh, let's see how far we get. We're gonna go to 845 today. Um, if any of you need to leave early, go ahead, because I don't understand how this is supposed to work right now, but I'm gonna go to 845 and I'll post the lectures to YouTube, so if you missed some of this, that's fine. Uh, first herb, mahuang, ephedra herba. Um, mahuang is, contains ephedrine. This is why mahuang has been somewhat banned. Um, we don't worry about this. Mahuang is not a particularly dangerous herb in this dosage range. All of the doses in Bensky are relatively low. I have seen mahuang used in 30 gram dosages. I've seen it used higher. For now, stick to low dosages. For your entire time that you're in school, stick to the Bensky dosages of herbs unless you have a supervisor who's happy to go higher. Uh, did you guys learn uh, Futsa in Intro to Herbs? Shafutsa, Akinidi, Radix, Lateralis, Preparata. Okay, um, so I believe that this is 1.5 to 4 grams, maybe 1.5 to 9. I've used that in 30 grams with patients. But you should know what you're doing before you do it. So these dosages that are listed, I would say that 2 to 9 grams is the generally considered to be safe dosage. That doesn't mean you never go higher. It just means, unless you know what you're doing, stay in this range. And you're basically safe if you do that and observe the caution. Caution means probably don't use this. Contraindication means you'd better not use this unless you have an excellent reason to. Okay. So mahuang, warm, acrid, slightly bitter. Lung, urinary, bladder. Warm, acrid, lung, urinary, bladder. We just described this chapter of the book. The slightly bitter is mostly to acknowledge the effect that it has on the urinary bladder channel. So on the one hand, we could say that ma huang um, I mean, induces sweating, releases the exterior. That's straightforward. It's accurate, it pushes outwards, and it affects the exterior. We, we're done there. Um, warm and disperses cold pathogens. Yeah, that's because it's warm and accurate and it goes to the exterior. We're done there too. Promotes urination and reduces edema is interesting. This herb doesn't promote urination. It promotes urination when there's edema present and we want to get rid of it. Now, that's half true because this is a diuretic herb. It'll promote urination for anybody. If you take a fed, if you take mahuang, you'll urinate more. Just like if you drink black tea, you'll urinate more. But we want to use this for its function of promoting urination. We go, ooh, this is an especially good reason to use mahuang if a person gets a wind cold invasion and it comes with edema or swelling. If the person has swelling, if they have urinary retention for any reason, they take mahuang and they're not urinating a little bit more in the way that you'd be thinking of with black tea, all of a sudden that edema is gone from their system. The reason they get the edema in the first place is this wind cold pathogen that invades the urinary bladder channel blocks the urinary bladder channel from being able to descend fluid to the urinary bladder to be urinated outwards. So we've blocked the ability of fluids to naturally progress downwards to the urinary bladder. We bring in a little bit of that bitterness and that warmth and acridity opens up the urinary bladder channel, fluids flow downwards, and they're able to urinate again. Mahuang is one of the first herbs we go to for wind cold invasions with facial edema specifically because of this function. Does that make sense? Okay, Guajir. Cinnamami ramulus, we use two different parts of cinnamon. We use Cinnamami ramulus and Cinnamami cortex. Cinnamami ramulus is you take the twig and you usually cut it on, on a diagonal. Cinnamon cortex is the most, for the people here who like cinnamon, when you get a chance, go to Cam Wo and ask them for like 10 grams of their highest grade cinnamon cortex. It's a piece of bark about this thick and as you break it open, it almost has little purple veins in it and it smells more like cinnamon than cinnamon essential oil does. It's rich, full, multi-layered, it's wonderful. When I was in acupuncture school um, in my third year, so right as I was starting to be, yeah, when, when I was an intern and I was prescribing a lot of herbs, I was dating a woman who was always cold and had a little bit of an internal cold issue. I gave her around Christmas a big chunk of this and I recommended like, look, just carry little pieces with you in your purse. And if you get cold outside in the winter in New York, eat a piece. It would warm her from the toes to her fingers comfortably. 
cinnamon is a surprisingly powerful herb, but we relegate it to something that you, that you notice is at Starbucks but don't put in your coffee because most of what we get is so low quality that it doesn't do anything. That's not true of high quality cinnamon. So when we're talking about some of the functions of cinnamon ramulus, guizhou, like the assists the heart young and blocks the young cheese of trest, warms the middle and directs turbid yin downwards, yes, this does this, but if that's what we want to do, we're probably going to the cinnamon cortex, which is in the warm interior expel cold category, not in the warm acrid release exterior category. If we're using this for its exterior releasing quality, and it becomes doubly valuable if there's a little bit of extra cold affecting the heart and the chest. So someone gets a wind cold invasion and they begin to have some difficulty breathing, not because of lung issues, but because all of the muscles in their chest get tight. So we're talking about normally you get a wind cold invasion, back of the neck closes down, you start getting a headache. Sometimes instead back of the neck closes down and the shoulders lock up and the chest gets tight. The person often comes in breathing with the accessory muscles and the diaphragm, but the chest itself is a little bit tight. And this is a great herb for unblocking the yang chi of the chest. That's one of the things we use it for. But the main thing is that it releases the exterior and assists the yang. Now this is different when we say releases, releases the exterior and assists the yang, that's different from inducing sweating and releasing the exterior. Inducing sweating is the ma huang is directly acting on the body and pushing that sweat out. You give mahuang to anybody, they're gonna sweat. Guaija does not promote sweating. That's not one of its functions. It does release the exterior, but it, its function of releasing the exterior comes from assisting the yang. So we're gonna use guaija more for deficient patients than for excess patients. Mahuang is for excess patients. Guaija is for deficient patients. That's what we use them for. One of the ways that you know that guaijiu is for deficient patients is because it's sweet. We use sweet herbs when we need to tonify. So warm, acrid, and sweet versus warm, acrid, slightly bitter. Lung, urinary, bladder, and heart versus just lung and urinary bladder. The heart is going to bring in all of this warm, warming aspect. We're going to a fire organ with a warm herb, and we're assisting that in doing its job. So I could compare this to um, Ma Huang is like bringing a bulldozer and bulldozing uh, an area that needs to be bulldozed. Guajir is more like going in and giving a cup of hot coffee to the person who normally drives the bulldozer and asking them to do it for you. Guajir is supporting the system that's already in place within our body. Ma Huang is coming in and doing it for your body. Guajir is not draining. Guajir doesn't exhaust you. You're going to end up about as excess or deficient as you were when you started, Ma Huang will make you more deficient than when you started. This makes sense? You guys understand the distinction here? Yeah, that makes sense for me. I mean, I guess my clarifying question is, um, you mentioned that, sorry, Guajir is more, um, is more for deficient patients, whereas Ma Huang is more for blank. Excess. Can you just go, excess, thank you, okay. Yep. I guess I should have gotten so, that, yeah. Um, very short aside, if we look at the formulas that these use in Ma Huang Tong is for patients who have a wind cold and are not sweating. Wei Zhu Tong is for patients who have a wind cold and are already sweating, but the sweating does not resolve the condition. So normally we think of the wind cold coming in and blocking the person and shutting everything down. Ma Huang takes care of that. Wei Zhu is for when the wind cold comes in and the person doesn't have enough fight in them to push it off. They're leaking, they're sweating, and the guajir comes in and goes, hey, let's, let's finish off this wind cold together. If you use the ma huang very often, the person will sweat a lot, and then they'll feel worse afterwards if you use it incorrectly. In ma huang tang, we also have guajir. They play well together, but in guajir tang, we do not use ma huang. So if you want to treat an excess condition, you can use ma huang and guajir together. Using it, if you're treating a deficient condition, you're looking at just guajir because the sweetness helps support the deficient patient. Okay, warming the middle, directing turbidity downwards. If things are congested, you warm, the turbidity and the clear separate. It's fairly straightforward. Um, I wouldn't worry too much about these functions. Know them, know them for your exams, know all of this for your exams, but I wouldn't worry too much about these two or this one. 
it will warm and unblock the channels and collaterals, but we don't really use it for that. We use other things. It'll warm the young and transform thin mucus in the chest a little bit, but we usually use other things. Okay, dosage is standard, and we don't use it if the person has heat. It's pretty straightforward. And uh, we're careful during pregnancy, but not that careful. Three to nine grams is not high anyway. Like, we're not worried about a pregnant woman having a stick of cinnamon in her coffee. Like, that's having a chai is not something that's particularly concerning. So we're not really that worried about this either. Zitsu Ye is a little bit different. Perlie folium. So this is the first time we're hitting aromatic as a function. Warm acrid, we've dropped urinary bladder. We're not talking about urinary bladder anymore. We're talking about the lung and the spleen. What this means is that we're using this less for wind cold within the Shangha Mun sense and more for wind and cold affecting the lungs and affecting the digestive system. Now, I wouldn't put too much stock into this affecting the spleen because I think that mostly comes from the fact that traditionally this was used to treat seafood poisoning. You guys know when you buy a uh, really cheap sushi, like sushi from gas station, and it comes and it's got, you know, like the really pink ginger in it, and it's got like the really weird looking green wasabi, and it's got that little plastic thing that kind of looks like a picket fence in it. That used to be zitsuya. If you were in Japan and you're eating sushi in a very traditional restaurant, you'll sometimes get these little purple green leaves that come with it. You eat that because it prevents seafood poisoning, which not that long ago was pretty important with sushi. Um, so when you think this yeah, gorilla folium, think of the little green piece of plastic that comes with sushi and you will never forget that this treats seafood poisoning. We also use it for restless fetus or morning sickness. Restless fetus is a polite way of saying threatened miscarriage. It can mean just that the fetus is moving around, but that's not really a problem. What we mean is that the fetus is moving around in a way that we're concerned about. So patients who have a history of miscarriages, we might think of this. This is also for people who have morning sickness in a way that looks like food stagnation. It looks like cold and damp sitting in the middle. And this is largely the aromatic function doing both of these things. The pregnancy and seafood poisoning is mostly coming from aromatic and spleen. For these two, promoting movement of chi and expanding the chest, that's just lung, warm, and acrid working together, except for the word expanding, which is aromatic. So acrid moves things, aromatic opens things. It opens in all directions. Aromatic tends to move along the channel or outwards. Aromatic tends to explode things outwards. So someone who's constrained everywhere inwards and really tight, we might be looking at aromatic. Sometimes we'll use aromatic along with things like salty to treat things like cysts going in and using the salty to begin to dissolve the exterior and using the aromatic to almost break it open into different pieces that we can treat it in that manner. The dosage here is also standard, though a little bit higher. They're basically saying, yeah, this is weaker than the other ones, but you also don't need that much. And we don't use it if we don't need to. When you see things like heat, chi, or whey deficiency, in a category like warm acrid release exterior, all they're really saying is don't use this herb if there's no reason to use it. And that's always true. Does that make sense? We're going a little bit quick here. Are people with me? You can ask questions. Can you repeat, you said this is less for wind cold in a Shang Hun Lin sense and more about wind cold in, I missed that, what you just said. It's more of a Zong Fu sense. I mean, I think Zitsuya shows up well, here, you know, this is where we do this. Good question. And you're not the only one with a PDF. So, yeah. Externally contracted wing. What I'm looking for here is, yeah, so we're looking quite a bit later than the Shanghan Lun. This is not from the same time period as the Shanghan Lun was developed in. Strong Humlin thinking was still going on, but other things have come in. Um, its aroma harmonizes the middle, as I was talking with the, about with the aromatic part. Promotes chi movement, revives the spleen, the, the digestive part. Yeah, so all we're saying here really is it's acrid and warm and it helps push stuff out of the exterior, but we could use this just as much for someone who, let's say, um, has a cold invasion 
from say uh, working in a frozen area, someone who's an ice fisherman who comes back with cold as an invasion as opposed to a wind cold. Cold you just get from cold exposure. Wind cold you get from a very specific type of cold exposure. When we're talking about wind cold, we're usually working with the urinary bladder in the lungs. Cold exposure itself, that can be frostbite, that can be a whole bunch of things that can happen in other ways. Um, so, yeah, and to get more, as you go through your education, once you get to formulas, the way that you're going to be getting further understanding of when this is used is by looking at the actual formulas it's in. So here they talk about um, Xiang, uh, Xing Susan and Xiang Susan, these two formulas, both of which are used for pretty superficial wind cold with a cough and a little bit of phlegm. That answer your question? You can go into the commentary for more stuff about this as well. Uh, accurate, accurate, shield, for the Everyone can vent wind outward, one from the middle, living to the chest back here. Yeah, don't use too much because it'll slowly drain the patient. Otherwise, you're pretty much good to go. They're comparing it to uh, regulate chi herb and they're comparing it to ginger, both of which are not really uh, going to be releasing a wind cold in the same way. So you think of Zitsuya when you think of pregnant women, especially pregnant women with a cold invasion. You don't want to give ephedrine to a pregnant woman. So if you have a pregnant woman who comes into your practice who has caught a wind cold invasion, we might be looking at this herb. Anytime you see an herb that says use during pregnancy for whatever, they're also telling you this herb is safe to use for any reason during pregnancy. It's a safe pregnancy herb. Um, and yeah, the uh, Huoshang Zheng Shi Sun, this is for um, the promote movement of qi and expand the chest, is also partially for food poisoning. So this is one that, yeah, it's in warm, acrid release exterior, but we could also put this in the food stagnation chapter because it kind of can fit in either one comfortably. You with me? Does that make sense? And again, like I'm trying to give uh, context and some understanding and some reasons for why these herbs have the qualities they do so that you can have some level of logical understanding of how they fit together like a puzzle. But at the end of the day, you also just, this all has to be known. Um, okay. Jingjie Schizonepete Herba. Um, this one, uh, I mean, I know this is kind of silly, but it worked for me. Uh, the fact that it's got schizo in the name to me makes me think it's going in a bunch of directions at the same time in kind of a schizophrenic way. And this herb looks like a very thin stalk with a bunch of little puffs coming out the side that kind of point out. Um, that was enough for me to never forget this herb and what it went with. Slightly warm, so we've cooled down a little bit and acrid. We're going to lung, and for the first time, we're seeing liver show up here. Um, Jonathan, to your question earlier about what do we mean about getting things out of the body, here we're venting rashes and alleviating itching. I'm going to talk about charring in just a second. Venting rashes and alleviating itching and releasing the exterior and dispelling wind. If we pop back over to then see, then we're going to see in there that this herb is interesting. So, okay. Jing Jie gets used together with Fang Feng. These two herbs go together very frequently. Slightly warm, slightly warm. In a pinch, you can use these for a wind heat or a wind cold. You can use these for any external condition or, well, either temperature of external condition. You need to use the other herbs in the formula to balance them out. But Jing Jie and Fang Feng together can be a pair of herbs that make up your central venting herbal combination, and then you can construct the rest of the formula so that it can treat either one. It does other things as well, such as venting rashing, rashes. Uh, anyone here want to take a guess as to why this would affect itching? We haven't seen itching as a symptom before in this chapter. Why Jing Jie and not any of the other ones? What is itching in Chinese medicine? Itching is wind. So the liver 
sort of has to do with. Excellent. So when we're talking about venting rashes and alleviating itching, uh, we're talking about, in Bensky, he says, for the initial stage of measles and pruritic skin eruptions, so hot skin eruptions, um, and goes on to say, this can be used for when due to blood deficiency. So not an externally contracted condition, but instead an internally generated one. This can also be used for, so um, people who have long-term blood deficiency can also often end up with wind on the skin and a lot of itching. This is an herb that treats that. Um, yeah, we're not gonna go into the other reasons it's used for itching, that's good enough. Uh, we're going to talk about, I guess we're probably going to have to talk about paujas next week. Paujas means um, methods of preparation of herbs. That doesn't mean how you cook this at home. It means how you ask the herbalist to prepare it before they give it to you in the first place. One of the options is charring an herb. If you char an herb, it stops bleeding. Not all herbs do this once they're charred, but some do. We're going to see probably half a dozen herbs this semester where you're going to want to char them if you want to stop bleeding. In this case, we do stop bleeding um, for blood in the stool or uterine bleeding. And uh, there's a dampness component to that usually. So honestly, we don't do that a whole lot. And this is really not the main herb we'd be going to for that. But if a patient comes in, they've seen their OBGYN. Their OBGYN is flummoxed. They don't know what's going on. But this person has spotting all the time. They can't stop it. They don't know what's going on. They don't know why. The OBGYN doesn't know why. The OB wants to put them on birth control just to regulate their period. But this is the only problem they have. This is one of these places where we come in and we start using herbs that stop bleeding, um, along with trying to figure out what the deeper root is of this to resolve that. And we're good at that sort of thing. And usually we can treat them for a brief period of time and then they don't need to continue taking herbs. Once again, we're looking at a fairly standard dosage. And once again, don't use it if there isn't a reason to use it. Pretty straightforward. It gets used all the time with Fong Fung, the Pashnikovia erratix. Once again, slightly warm. With Jing Jie, we're just slightly warm and acrid. With Fong Fung, slightly warm, acrid, and sweet. So we know there's going to be a mildly tonic aspect to this. Urinary bladder, liver, spleen. So between these two herbs, we've hit lung and urinary bladder. These two get used together all the time. It's called a, we're going to keep hitting these con concepts that are important. Um, we have a whole bunch of herbs that are called, there's my chat box, there we go, um, that are called Dwei Yao pears. Dwei Yao's are, herb, are pairs of herbs that are used together all the time because they play so well together that we don't really like using them by themselves. Sometimes we'll use Feng Feng or Jing Jie without the other one, but usually they go together because those channels balance each other out so nicely. So if we're looking to use these functions together, they play well together. Summers do not play well together, these two. So if someone release the exterior, expel wind, release the exterior, dispel wind, just consider those the same thing. Matriocha has a synonym problem. Consider dispel and expel the same for now. Um, it doesn't say wind heat. It doesn't say wind cold. Again, these, this pair can be used for wind heat or wind cold. It can also be used if there's a damp component or a liver deficiency, blood deficiency component. So often we're going to be adding in an herb like Dong Gui that you learned last semester if there's a blood deficiency component. That's not going to be enough on its own to create a long-term change, but it, it will play well with other herbs that will create a long-term change. Um, we're going pretty fast here. You guys wanna just take a quick five minutes as a breather? Like, I don't wanna make you guys go an hour and 20 minutes straight here. Just take five minutes, stretch out. We'll go into the next one. I'm gonna get a cup of water. I'm still here to answer questions, but just shake it out. Um, yeah, we're, we're, we're moving quick and I don't wanna overwhelm you guys week one. Feel free to ask questions, I'm still here.
for anyone who's been uh, in my other classes in the past few semesters, uh, this is the new clinic space I'm in. I'm very excited about the library that it came with. I'm going to turn on a light to show this off. But we're going to have a lot of herbal books that I'm going to be pulling down and talking about for people who are curious about expanding their library. I know we have some bibliophiles who come to this school. And uh, I happen to have entered a business partnership with one who's gone a little over the top. There's uh, two rows of books in most of these places. So we're gonna have a whole bunch of things that I can pull down and we can talk about. Let me see if we've got... I'm looking specifically for the Dwei Yao book and the Powder book. may or may not be here. I thought this would be here. Maybe. This isn't exactly well organized. I'll copy the things into the chat so you can just get um, an idea of what I'm talking about. So um, I'm getting some private messages here in the chat. Um, my, I'm just going to reiterate, my goal is to make sure that there are some herbs where it's like, this herb just does this. I don't have a great explanation. That's what we're doing. And you just got to memorize it. But my goal is to make that happen as rarely as possible. Um, and this is one of the reasons. So I've just copied two books in here, the Pao Zhu book and the Dui Yao book. They're both cheap. They're both real cheap, like 20 bucks. Um, they're both also fairly short. Uh, I would recommend pick, picking them up if you're kind of a nerdy book person. Um, apparently, some of your colleagues have a lot of digital books, so maybe talk to them too. These books are at the school in the library. I don't really know what's going on with the online library these days, but I think you can email Svetlana as well. They're worth flipping through. I've never really used them as an actual clinical reference, but I've probably spent I don't know, five hours with each one and found it valuable. Um, so when I mentioned at the beginning of this class that this should inform your acupuncture and your acupuncture should inform this, and this should all be based on the fund, on the SDM theory. What I mean by that is all of the functions should make sense. It shouldn't just be this herb does this, move on. Um, that'll happen occasionally, but it should actually be logical. Okay, you guys ready to start back up? <sighs> okay. So, Cheng Huo. I don't know why, but I, I have a real love of this herb. Um, I've had some miraculous success using this herb um, for a number of different things. 
there's going to be a couple times, there's going to be a handful of times this semester where we pause on an herb and I just say, aside from its stated functions, I just love this one. Um, and Cheng is one of them. So, Nodotarigi rhizoma cirratix, nice long name. Um, Nodotarigi, it almost has Peter in there, it's P T E R. So, if you want to remember that Peter loves this herb, then you're also going to, it's also going to help you remember the Latin. Warm, acrid, bitter, and aromatic going to the urinary bladder and the kidneys. We're not going to the lung anymore. We don't care about the lung. We're done with the lung for this herb. We're going to a completely different way of addressing a wind cold invasion. Chung Ho is going to release the exterior and disperse cold. I think it does it surprisingly aggressively. Um, I, I don't find it damaging to the patients, but it's, it's quite good at expelling cold in this way. Unblocks painful obstruction and alleviates pain. If a person has gotten sick and has a massive headache, a really bad headache, especially in the Thai, uh, an occipital one, this is your occipital headache sickness herb. Done. It's great. This is also the first herb that's an envoy. So you're gonna spend one more time, one more second talking about this herb as an envoy. Let's say you have a patient who comes in with scoliosis and you want to treat them only with herbs. You want to try to straighten out their spine with herbs. First off, good luck. That's going to be challenging. They've got really mild scoliosis and they're young and they're still growing. You might be able to pull that off. If they're 60, you probably shouldn't take their money. Um, if you're going to be treating the spine and trying to straighten it out, then you're going to need an herb that directs to the dew channel. And that's what this herb does. If for some reason you want to affect a person's dew channel, this could also be someone who's had a spinal injury and you want to go in and try to work with it. Someone who has blood stagnation in their spine, someone who's been going to the chiropractor for 30 years for their mid back pain that's located in their spine from when they had a car accident when they were 15 and you want to get in there and treat it and you want to use herbs to do it, you're probably putting Chung Huo into your formula. If you're using it as an envoy, then you're probably using three grams and then the rest of the formula is going to be moving blood or raising chi, or whatever's appropriate for the patient. Same is true for Taeyong. Let's say a patient comes in and they've got, um, they've taken some real rough chemotherapeutic drugs and they've managed to get blood stagnation in their urinary bladder, which happens, leading, leading to incontinence and painful urination. We might wanna put a bunch of herbs that move blood directly into their urinary bladder, but we don't necessarily want to affect their whole system. Let's say the chemotherapy has made them very weak. Affecting their entire system with blood moving herbs is going to deplete them. It's going to make them more tired. We want to get specific as opposed to systemic, which is one of the tricks we have with Chinese medicine and often Western medicine doesn't get to do. So we want to go right into that urinary bladder. That means we want an herb that goes there. We want an herb that guides to that. And Changhuo is our guiding herb, one of our guiding herbs for both Taeyong and the Du channel. These, this envoy thing, it sounded a little silly to me when I was starting off, works surprisingly well. It, it, it's more real than it feels like it should be. The other nice thing is that basically no contraindications. It's pretty safe. Don't use, so um, another thing about contraindications and cautions, they're telling you, there's, every herb has a ton of contraindications and cautions, but they're not going to tell you the ones that you would have to be an absolute idiot to do. They're telling you the things that you might make mistakes about. So in this case, they're saying, when they say stagnation due to blood deficiency, they're saying, yeah, obviously you're going to want to use this herb for stagnation and blood stagnation. Don't do it if the stagnation is due to deficiency. This herb moves stagnation. It moves it pretty well. The aromatic aspect, especially if we're talking about blood stagnation seated deeply within the spinal column or even on the anterior aspect of the spinal column, you want to affect that, the aromatic aspect of this can help pop that open. A little bit of caution, this can cause pain if you're moving that much blood stagnation quickly. This herb is strong, but it's not dangerous. We have herbs that are much stronger and are dangerous, but this isn't one of them. It's relatively safe. It's really aromatic. You smell this one, it doesn't look like it should be. Does anyone here have their herb kit handy? We can like hold this up to the camera. Um, maybe give it a smell, describe it a little bit. It, it's got, it doesn't, it looks like a piece of, like a tree branch you would find in Central Park, but it's got a smell like something you'd use in small doses when cooking. 
Um, if yours doesn't have odor, take a piece out, crack it open, and smell it again. Um, it has a very, it has some very distinctive, at first glance, this herb just blends in with all of the stick-like herbs that we have. On closer examination, it has an interior structure that has very clear striations that separates it away from all the other herbs. We'll go over, um, when we do the midterm review maybe, we'll, we'll spend some time talking about how to ID some of the harder herbs. Jared, do you get much of an odor off of yours? You sure should. Yeah, it smells nice. Yeah. Like the aromatic is like very present, definitely. Yep. It's like, yeah, you could cook with it. Like it almost yeah. looks like sawdust and how they gave this one, but it smells nice. That's okay. Uh, let's see here. Let me, um, um, yeah, here we go. Okay, this will work. Um, so, um, that's, that's the wrong one. That's the cut that you're usually going to see. So these lines here, this little bit sticks up and then it, it indents, sticks up, indents. So you, you've got almost like a ribbed interior. And if you crack this open, it has quite an odor. If you just look at the outer bark aspects, good luck IDing this. You're looking for this interior structure to be able to tell what this is. You can see the gaps forming naturally over here very nicely. If you get it given to you like this, good luck IDing it. Um, this is not a standard presentation of it, so I've seen that as well. Usually it looks like this, and you're looking for those, those lines. Okay. Um, so, Chang Huo. Yeah, go ahead. You said you love it because you've had good success with it and what you were just saying about um, kind of releasing like old trauma in the spine or something like that from an injury. Is that the kind of stuff that you're talking about that you've used it for and had good success with? Or um, I have a completely irrational like of it just at the level of I like the smell, I like the way it feels, I like the way it tastes, I like every piece of it. In addition to that, I've had good success treating long-term problems in the neck with this specifically. And I've heard lots of stories of treating all sorts of spinal issues with this. Yeah. Thanks. I, yeah, I like this for, I mean, so if we're talking about the Du channel and the Tai Yang, right, we're basically talking about all of the back of the neck. So anyone who has long-term stagnation issues through this area right here, not over on the gallbladder, right along the back here, someone who's like, it hit like right in here, very base of the skull, always painful. Topical herbs along with Chang Huo, appropriately combined internally, surprisingly successful. It just like, it's just gone and doesn't come back. Great. So great herb, one of my favorites. Semi-rationally. It's very functional, but also I just kind of like it. Um, and I mean, you're gonna see this as you go through, like people have personal relationships with herbs. Like some of your professors will just keep recommending the same herb and different combinations over and over because they love it. Um, and often, like some, there are some herbs like I think um, Huang Lian tastes really good. Most people, it makes nauseous because of the bitterness. Different for different people. Okay, let's get through a few more herbs. Kyrie, I'm glad you like the smell. Really nice incense smell, right? That's that aromatic. It just like goes in, is like, ah. Yeah. If you can get it really fresh, the smell is quite intense. Like I just got. Um, this is the sort of thing that if we had in-person class, I'd share this with you. <clears throat> you guys would be tasting all sorts of stuff and I would do my best not to make any of you throw up in the semester. Um, high grade Tibetan citron peppercorns. I ate one of these earlier today and almost threw up just experimenting with it. <laughs> um, Part of being an herbalist, you, you can occasionally poison yourself accidentally and out of curiosity, but they're amazing. I would use that in a heartbeat for someone with, um, so uh, you can get cold invasions directly through the roof of the mouth that cause long-term sinus problems. Easiest way to treat it, direct application of very hot herbs into the mouth. So you make a mouthwash with a hot herb, they rinse repeatedly, all of a sudden the sinus problems due to cold begin going away. Okay, um, Gaobun, Ligustici, Rhizoma. People pronounce the Latin for these things differently. 
occasionally you're going to see people spelling some of these things differently. If you talk to botanists, often they have slightly different Latin than we have. But um, yeah, they're, uh, yeah, they're, they're, you'll, you'll see some variations. Like some people are going to say gentian for long down south. Some people are going to say gentian. Just roll with it as you do it. Um, I got taught this is legustasi. That's probably wrong, but that's how I know it. Um, so it's gal bun, warm and acrid. And once again, we're going to the dew and the urinary bladder. So when we look at chang huo, urinary bladder and kidney, the kidney helps us affect the bones when we're talking about the dew channel, guides to the taiyang and dew. Here we go directly to the dew. We do not have a lot of herbs that go to the extraordinary meridians. So when you see one, I'm probably going to test you on it. You should definitely write down anything that goes to an extraordinary, anything that goes to an extraordinary meridian, anything that treats pregnant women, anything that has to do with seafood poisoning, like there's there's anything that's like this is an herb for old people. We're going to be, those are things that you're going to get tested on. So make sure you make note of things that are odd, like the dew channel. Discharges exterior conditions and disperses cold, dispels whim, overcomes dampness, alleviates pain. Um, this is another herb that's mostly used for headaches due to external invasion. So remember when we were talking earlier about the hierarchy of herbs, chief, deputy, assistant, envoy, this is usually an assistant. This is coming in, you, you're using ma huang and gui zhe to kick out the wind cold, but the person's got a killer headache in the occipital region. You can use gao bun or cheng huo. Moderately interchangeable. I like cheng huo. That's my preference. Um, if you have dampness as well, then you might be thinking more gao bun. So if the person's coming in, a lot of back of the neck congestion, but they're also kind of sticky and a little greasy and their pulse is like, floating but also kind of slippery and their tongue has too thick of a coat and their sinuses are clogged but there's also phlegm coming out of them and like their eyes look a little bit goopy and a little bit fuzzy and they're like I just feel like my head's full of cotton and I can't think straight and I just want to go to sleep but when I lie down I hate it it feels terrible then we're talking a little bit more about gal bun because all of that all of what I just said is a reflection of dampness being present along with the external passenger and that's when we look at galbon. Again, standard dosage. Again, caution and contraindications. Pretty straightforward. Um, uh, so occasionally we're going to mention herbs that are, have a caution or contraindication with pregnant women. Just because we're not saying that this has a caution or contraindication with pregnant women doesn't mean go ahead and use it with pregnant women. If you want to give herbs to pregnant women, you either stick to the herbs that are like, this is for pregnant women, or you train specifically in how to use other herbs for pregnant women. This is similar to acupuncture points for pregnant women. I'm sure you guys have heard about like, you never do gallbladder 21 or large intestine four on a pregnant woman. That's not true at all. You just don't know, you just don't use them unless you know exactly why you're using them. So you don't use them as a student. You don't use them unless you begin specializing in them. Does that make sense? Um, I have a question. Yeah. So what, what's the difference between um, gao ben and du huo? They seem so similar to me. Uh, they're quite different. So let me, um, let me pull up du huo and ben pi, and we can just look at the difference. I mean, they're in different categories. That's a good place to start. So. Um, and they look so similar. I want to be able to show this to all of you at the same time. Here we go. Oh, God, I love it, being able to search through a file on a computer to get this stuff. Come on, come on. Until my computer freezes. One second. Okay. So let's look at Duho, Angelica pubicentis radix. Um, first off, we're in a different category. We're in the herbs that spell wind dampness category. So if we're talking about exams, make sure you don't put the wrong category. Uh, why won't this let me scroll? Sorry, one second. This is not letting me interact with the page. All 
Okay, my, my computer is giving me a problem now. Um, so, quick story, Stu Huo uh, spells wind dampness, alleviates pain, disperses wind cold, releases the exterior. Also used for Xiao Yin stage headaches and toothaches. So the main difference here is going to be in the the main difference is going to be in when we use these things. We're going to be using Gao Bun as an assistant when we have a wind cold invasion, and we're going to be using Du Huo as a chief when we have a wind damp invasion. That's the difference. Um, okay. Okay. So. Um, yes, there are a lot of similarities between the two. They go to different channels, kind of. The duple goes to the kidney and the bladder. Um, but the main thing is, so, oh, what's the right way to answer this, this at this stage? Um, duple is way, way stronger and we use more of it. So if we look at the cautions and contraindications of duple, it's extremely dry and it damages the yin in patients. So while on, on first pass, um, gao bun being warm and acrid, urinary bladder and dew, du huo, uh, bitter, acrid and warm, kidney and bladder. Yeah, the, uh, God, what's the way to explain this? We use gao bun in small doses to assist with a little bit of dampness that's accompanied to wind cold. We use du huo in large doses when wind dampness has come in, whether it's warm or cold. With Du Huo, we're going to see dampness as the chief uh, pathogen that the person is dealing with. So there may be cold, but in this case, we're looking at things more like arthritis that's affected by cold weather or by wet, damp weather. Like if you have a patient who comes in and they say, um, I know it's going to rain because my knees are starting to hurt. That's a sign that you might want to use Du Huo. That's wind dampness there. For Gao Bun, we're mostly looking at that dampness being in the neck and the head region, and Du Huo is mostly a lower body herb. We're mostly using this for low back dampness, hips, legs. Du Huo is used in a lot of orthopedic formulas for people who, for not, not old people, but like middle-aged people who begin getting low back pain that's made worse with cold and damp weather. So on first glance, they look similar, but they're pretty different. Um, at the end of the day here. Yeah, and so when we're saying urinary bladder with Du Huo, we're talking more about the channel and more about the bottom half of the channel, less the head. We're, we're not really talking about the head at all. Wind dampness is a whole different thing. So I'd recommend um, in the herbs that dispel wind dampness chapter, just read those first couple paragraphs again. They talk a lot about painful obstruction. When we talk about wind dampness, we're mostly talking about painful obstruction, and that's not what Galbun is treating. As much as it kind of looks like it is, it isn't. It's treating um, wind that's come along. I suppose it has created painful obstruction, but it's very transient painful obstruction in the head, as opposed to this long-term chronic painful obstruction in the hips and low back and legs. Um, yeah. Okay. That answer your question? Yes. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, good question. Though. I mean, like that's so. But I, I, I like the way you're thinking because you just, I'm assuming. You know, you learned Duquo last semester and you're looking at like, well, the flavors and the temperature and the channels are pretty similar. So shouldn't it be pretty similar? And a lot of the times you can derive the functions from the channels and the flavors. In this case, we're looking at different ends of the channels and different levels of chronicness. In a pinch, you might be able to do a little bit of substitution there, but yeah, they're, they're decently different. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, good question. Um, okay, let me back to this we, we're gonna let's see if we can get through two more herbs and then we'll stop for today um and then we'll take any questions you guys have uh by Ju, angelica de hurricane radix um so uh this is oh, i can't repeat the stories that uh so I, I had some friends who came up with stories for a bunch of these herbs to help remember them expels wind eliminates dampness unblocks the nasal passages alleviates pain Reduces swelling, expels pus, expels dampness, alleviates discharge. Talking about discharge here, we're talking about either nasal or vaginal discharge. Either one. When we're talking about the unblocking the nasal passages, eliminates pain. This is for, again, when wind comes in with a dampness quality and completely clogs the nose. This can also be used for physical trauma clogging the nose if there's a damp component. 
Um, the reducing swelling and expelling pus is also often for, uh, I had to quit out of Bensky and I wanna make sure I'm getting all of this right. Yeah, so if you have a patient who comes in and their chief complaint with their wind cold is pain in this region, anywhere here, gums, teeth, nose, sinuses, behind the eyes, Bijer is the herb that you're adding in, in a small to moderate dose for clearing that out as an aspect of it. Sometimes people will catch a cold and their teeth or their gums get sensitive. You see this mostly in kids and elderly people. Bijer is nice for helping to clear that out. We're largely seeing that through the stomach channel affecting that entire region, right? Stomach channel coming down through the face. It's dampness in the stomach channel right here. Um, for the, for the uh, reducing swelling and expelling pus, that's the same thing. Things on the skin that need to be expelled. We don't see that that often. These people go to other practitioners for that than us most of the time. That being said, if anyone here is interested in Chinese medicine dermatology, there is wonderful Chinese medicine dermatology. Uh, you know the Deadman book, right? The acupuncture points book. Deadman's co-author is Mazen al Kafaji. He teaches the best uh, English language dermatology program in the world. He's in London. He comes to New York. He has a whole certification program. If you go through his course, you get added to the registry of people who can do this. Uh, the people I know who've gone through that course say it's as hard if not harder than the herb board exam to get into his program and you will get referred dermatology patients for the rest of your life and you can have an entire practice off of that and we're good at dermatology and western medicine has like five dermatology options and if they don't work the story's over so um yeah and this is one of the herbs that gets used uh we use this to treat so um the vaginal discharge is a little bit strange given the channels this goes to this is one of those herbs where it's like, well, how are we supposed to get vaginal discharge out of lung, stomach, and spleen? And I can spin a story about the spleen not transforming properly and so dampness shows up, but we're talking about dampness in the lower burner. This is someone who might have um, rashes along their belt line, rashes on their buttocks, like on, on the cheeks, rashes around their genitals, especially rashes with weeping sores, um, lots of odor coming from this region. These people are often quite ashamed, but they might come to your practice and they might talk to you about this. And Viger is an herb that can help to get all of that dampness out of that region in a way that lasts. If this also comes with foul vaginal discharge, then you've hit your herb. Viger is probably for this patient. Um, we're mostly looking at cold dampness there. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's a good herb. I, I, I like it. It's also got a surprisingly strong smell. It's usually just kind of like a white chunk. But if you crack it open, it kind of goes, oh, it'll help. It'll open your sinuses. Um, and the last thing is that we use this with gansau for ulcers, gansau being licorice, right? Um, in theory, we use this with gansau for ulcers. I haven't, I haven't seen that. We use gansau for ulcers, but I, I haven't really used Vichur for that. But I also haven't treated that many ulcers. So. I don't really know. Uh, don't use it with yin deficiency because this is a very drying herb, right? If an herb is drying, you don't use it with people who are dry. It'll make them worse. People can have yin deficiency and dampness at the same time. If they have yin deficiency and dampness at the same time, you have to deal with the dampness without injuring the yin, and this is not your herb for that. We have herbs in other categories for that. Um, standard dosage. Uh, ulcerated sores is a phrase you're going to see a lot. So when we say vents rashes, we mean something that like hasn't come to a head yet, hasn't opened up. But once these things do open up, once pus is coming out of something, once a rash is opened, we stop giving herbs that express rashes because it's already expressing. It's already it's already doing its thing. It doesn't need more help. Uh, shishin is a weird one. Shishin is an odd herb. Um, some materia medicas put this in the warm interior expel cold category as opposed to the warm acrid release exterior category. So it's a little flexible. First thing that I want you guys to know, low dosage, one to three grams. This is a powerful herb and a little bit dangerous. Not really dangerous, just, just a little bit. Uh, lung, heart, and kidney. As soon as you see heart in an external area, you know this herb is going to do something on the interior because the heart's not on the exterior. 
we're, we're looking at two organs, the heart and the kidney, both of which are fairly internal, pretty uh, as internal as you get until you go to the extraordinary organs. So if you see that in a category that's about the exterior, you know you're also going to do something on the interior. And in this case, the dispersing cold and relieving pain is for an interior cold, warming lungs and transforming thin mucus. That's just the warmth and acridity there. I don't think there's much. There's some interesting things, I think, in the commentary on this herb. Yeah, for pain due to wind and or cold anywhere in the body, but particularly headache, painful obstruction. Painful obstruction generally means arthritis. It means like some sort of locked pain, usually in a joint. It gets in the joints because that's where the sinew channels rope around, right? The sinew channels trap pathogens in the joint intentionally. We often see arthritis as a way of preventing a pathogen from getting to the organs. Um, painful obstruction, abdominal pain, or toothache. So headache, arthritis, abdominal pain, or toothache. That's pretty broad. So it can be used for quite a bit. Um, so often the conditions are marked by wind, cold, and dampness having obstructed the muscles to the point that there's no sweating because there's no fluids there, and even the blood cannot flow smoothly. So sometimes we use this herb for people who have things like cold hands and feet due to stagnation. Most of the patients that you see who have cold hands and feet have cold hands and feet because they have blood deficiency. But some of them have cold hands and feet because they have terrible circulation, which in our medicine is usually due to chi and blood stagnation, which is usually due to cold and damp. And if that's the case, chi xin is one of our herbs to help unblock that. So I would think of this more, yes, it disperses cold and releases the exterior, and that's the category we're in. But most of the time I see this used, it's for unblocking these channels. If you look at the herb, it almost looks like very dark, dried, almost like, um, like fossilized grass. It's like a little bulb with a bunch of these little tendrils coming off of it that are quite dark. Usually when you see things in that shape and form, it has a snaking function through the body. If you see that, you can probably think it's gonna do something unblocking. Not always, but all. And we're gonna stop there because I certainly don't wanna push you guys over tonight. Um, how was this? We're gonna be going at this speed for the rest of the semester, if not a little bit faster. How are you guys doing with that? This is crazy. It's gonna be a lot of uh, reading in the, you know, a lot of reading at home, you know? It's yep. <laughs> Well, I'm going to remind you, all that you have to know is what's on these pages. All this other stuff is to just help you understand why this is the case, how these things are interconnected, but you don't have to remember a word I said to pass my class, to pass the board exams, to pass your comprehensive exams. You just need to know what's, what's in these documents I'm sending you. So the rest of this is just to help understand it. I recommend you understand it. If I didn't think that was important, I wouldn't be teaching it. And if you only know what's on these pages, you're probably not really going to practice with herbs very much because it's not enough. But if you're getting overwhelmed, if you learn what's on these pages, then you'll be well set up to, um, to move into formulas, which is where you go to the next level of talking about how these things work. I think between it's the, a lot. I think it's a lot. The YouTube and the book, I think it's going to be fine. But the only thing is just to give the time to, to restudy it. But it's going to be fine, I think. It's going yep. to be it, it's a lot of work, but people do it. People get through this just fine. Um, this, I would say that the herbal program is about as much work as the rest of acupuncture school combined in terms of study. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm not going to make you guys know contraindications now. Let's, uh, I might highlight some for the midterm and the final that I want you to know. I want you to know the contraindications for the chapter for the section. I want you to know these contraindications here. You don't need to know the individual herb ones right now. That help, Liv? Cool. Great. Yeah. Um, so uh, for next week, don't worry about dosage, um, except for the weird dosages like shishin, which is very low. Don't worry about the cautions and contraindications. You need to know the rest of this for every single herb we covered. Don't worry about the ones we didn't get to. We'll stop there. I'm going to make a note of it in here so I don't accidentally give you guys too much. So we made it through. Yeah, we, we made it through almost everything. So that's good. 
I can spell. We have, um, do we have a quiz next week? Yes, you do. We're going to have a quiz on the herbs we covered today. Um, and the only other thing I'm going to test you on outside of the herbs today is I might ask you some questions about what does acrid do, what does sweet do, just based on just the text of the slides I gave you. I'm not going to test you on anything that I have not given you in writing except for extra credit. Some of the extra credit might be more about thinking about this. And we'll talk around midterms and finals about whether there's more thinking questions involved. But for now, I need you to be able to reproduce all of this. Some professors give you a blank sheet of paper and just ask you to write down everything. We're not gonna go that far. Um, but I do expect you to be ready to be tested on every word I have written on, this page, on these pages that we've covered, except dosage and contraindications. Um, with the exception of the contraindications for the category. Okay. I'm gonna have the uh, recording up. Tomorrow or Saturday. I can, I, I can, I can definitely have it up Saturday, probably tomorrow. I have to, I'm coming into the office to treat some people. Um, I, can, I can start that process here. The main problem with getting it uploaded is that it takes, the files are big, it takes a long time. But yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll have this up shortly and I will um, post a link in the Slack. And at least for the next week or two, I'll also be emailing all of this out to you until everyone's on the same page and we're moving smoothly. And then I would like to stop emailing and just use the Slack for a lot of this stuff. Yeah, the recordings are important. Watch them. I mean, that's, that's a good way to review this stuff. I would recommend this. Uh, flashcards are good. Um, you need to be able to reproduce this. I recommend like whatever your style of, of learning is, this is, these are the classes where you've really got to figure that out. So flashcards work for me. I would go for long walks with flashcards and just talk out loud. Gao bun, lu gusta si, radic. Just go through the whole thing. Um, I would spend a lot of time writing these things over and over. So I'd look at the flashcard and instead of saying it or thinking it, I'd write it down. One of the problems with thinking through a flashcard without either saying it or writing it is often you can make like a half error in your head and check it and you'd never know if you were right or not. But if you say it out loud, then you know you got it wrong or you know you got it right. Writing it down is the same thing. You actually have a record, you're more accountable to yourself. Um, yeah, this is gonna be a lot of work. It's worth it. The herbs are pretty phenomenal. Um, yeah. Uh, not this coming week. We'll talk about it after that. Definitely for the midterm and the final, I would like to make you guys do herb ID, but I'm definitely gonna give you a week or two until I can either compile photos of these herbs to send to you or until people can get their herb kits or both. Now, one of the challenges of making you do herb ID without a standardized way of looking at herbs is if I show you photos of the herb that are different than the cut of herb you have in your herb kit, that's confusing. So we'll, we'll, do it. we'll, we'll, we'll figure it out. Yeah, so on me, if you want to um, put those picks up on the Slack, that would be great. That'd be helpful. Yeah, it, um, yeah if people are having problems with the Slack, um, we, can, we can talk and try to sort that out. So I just got a message saying that from someone. Um, email me. We'll, we'll, we'll figure out a time. Let's get on a Zoom call and spend 10 minutes and figure out how to do it together. It, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, but that doesn't, you know, but if you're having trouble, you're having trouble and we'll figure it out. Okay, um, class is officially over. I'll hang out for another 10 minutes uh, for any other questions, but anyone who needs to go, you're welcome to go. Consider this the like I'm packing up and if people wanna talk to me by the front desk, by the whiteboard after class, this is now that period. Um, thanks guys. And uh, I'll see you next week. And I'll have all Thank this up you. and I'll email you and this will, we'll, we'll, we'll keep moving. Thanks, Peter. You're very welcome. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Thanks, everybody. Thank hey. you, Peter. Peter, what's your, what's your favorite formula that you end up using? Um, Ching Huo. In uh, oh, Chung Huo? I yeah, haven't Chung -Huo. used um, Chung Huo in a while because in most of my traveling, I haven't had access. Well, I haven't used it in the way I love to use it in a while because I haven't had access to a lot of raw herbs. Chung Huo is mm. one of the, a lot of the aromatic herbs I find work way better if you can get them raw. As soon as the processing happens, like you just start losing some of those volatile oils. Um, yeah, the yeah, granules uh, just don't quite cut it in, in how some of those herbs can really act. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I, I've got a, a saying that I've, I've used for a while, which is the best, um, the best form of herbs is the best form of herbs that your patients will actually take. Totally. You know, like raw mm. herbs are almost always the best. But if your patients won't take them, then they're terrible. So very often I end up um, using granules. More and more I'm trying to use, like since I just started up practicing in New York in you know, a month ago or so. Oh, uh, Christy, as you leave, you can pass the host back over to me. Um, it'll give you the option to close this for everybody or just leave. And if you just leave, it'll let you switch it back. Oh, 